You all right? We will call the council meeting to order. Everybody, stand for the pledge, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Clerk, take the roll. Mayor O'Connor here. Alms here. Dizio. Weber? Here. Atkins Hoggett? Here. And Hall? Here. I'm here too. She said. Oh, sorry, Randy. <laughs> More set. Oh, she went right to home. So here. Sure. Yeah. All right. The first thing we have on the agenda tonight is a public hearing. A public hearing on amendments to municipal sign code chapter 202 6 sub c and 202-6 sub E. This is an opportunity for anyone who would like to comment on, uh, on, these, uh, on these amendments. And uh, it is a public hearing, so um, anybody that is here, you can come forward to the microphone, identify yourself and your address, please. And if you are Zooming in, we can't see all the people that are on Zoom, so if you raise your hand, I'm not gonna be able to see that, so feel free to chime in, please not while somebody else is talking, but uh, unmute and then just chime in and we will get everybody that wants to make a comment, will have an opportunity to comment on this tonight. So again, it's a public hearing. I do wanna make this real clear uh, I'm not sure how many people are here for this, uh, but this is, this is not specifically about the school. It really has nothing to do with the school tonight, the sign that they want out in front of the high school. This has to do with the change to the code that would allow any type of electronic sign throughout the city. Okay, are we ready? Jim, yep. Yeah. Uh, Jim Ludiger and I live at 624 Hickory in High Point. Uh, here in Hudson, and I'm the president of the association. Um, I know you don't want to talk about this school, so I'll try to keep that as brief as I can. But You'll have time to do that in the future. I will, okay. Do you want me to, I can say a few words if that would be appropriate. That's fine. Okay. Um, I just want to make sure that everybody understands, this includes the city council, the planning commission, and all the residents of Hudson, that the people that live in High Point are not anti-school, we are not anti-sign, and frankly, we are not anti-new ordinance. Our objection will be uh, the variance uh, that comes up, uh, is expected to come up. Um, and we have a number of issues with that, uh, one of them being safety, traffic safety, uh, also light pollution emanating from the sign, but mostly, uh, frankly, is the issue of commercialization of our neighborhood. We live in a high density residential area and to have a sign essentially in our front yard uh, that's flashing constantly is inappropriate in our opinion. So uh, we're very worried about our property values and I know this is not about the school but um, I would ask the, the city council to consider respectfully that uh, any variance to an ordinance or the construction of that ordinance in its wording uh, would make sure that uh, you're not drafting it so that it, it jeopardizes the market value of homes in residential areas. Okay. So the proposed sign, by the way, is about 80 feet from our front of our homes. So that's it. Thank you. All right, thanks. And like I said, you will have plenty of opportunity. You'll have notice and plenty of opportunity when we take up that subject. First of all, this ordinance has to even pass before we could even take that up. So, Could I ask if there's any idea when that might be? Well, this will be if uh, after the public hearing tonight, it will be recommended back to the uh, to the plan commission. I think that's next next on the agenda is just a motion to bring it back to the plan commission. Plan commission uh, probably I don't know I haven't, if it's on the agenda for tomorrow or not. I would think probably not given the, but it might be. I don't think it is. Uh, but I don't think so given that the action is on this tonight. I think we would have to wait until the the the. Uh, plan commission meeting after next mike is here mike can you answer that we have an LA agenda tentatively for tomorrow night as well okay all right so tomorrow night will be on plan commission 
if it if it goes well at plan commission uh, passes plan commission then it comes back to the city council and uh, so that would be at the next meeting which would be the first meeting in September at the earliest and then if that is successful at some point in time the school then will come in with their request and then the uh, if I may ask also if the public forum will be uh, in front of the City Council or the Planning Commission the board of if it's a variance it would be board of appeals yeah if I may Kathy it's not a, the way the ordinance is currently structured it's not a variance it's a conditional use permit oh okay I'm, I'm so it would be both the plan commission and and council so and prior to application on neighborhood meeting would be required as well oh right that's why I say that you're gonna have plenty of notice about it and plenty of opportunity to come in and let your feelings be known super thank you very much you're more than welcome one thing about the mask is you can't see anybody smiling <laughs> okay all right uh, anybody else is there anyone else who would like to comment on this hey good evening my name is Mike Hipsch and I live at 625 Hickory Road uh, just a point of clarification um, I know the school sign is one issue changing the ordinance is another issue if the ordinance is ordinance isn't changed does that mean the sign cannot go forward uh, I don't know I um, not necessarily I don't think Mike you want to answer that foot. correct without a variance so then you'd be going back to the through a, a variance process so they are they are connected what you're discussing tonight is connected to the potential of the sign being approved well yes and no there are uh, there are other people that have been waiting for this ordinance change long before the school has came, came in requesting their sign so we have people here that have other signs up in different parts of the city that would like to convert to electronic and we have been waiting and kind of struggling with language on this for some time and now it's just finally coming to us okay I just want to reaffirm uh, everything that uh, Jim mentioned that uh, living at High Point it's one thing having the band practice 8 to 9 o'clock at night another thing having the scoreboard work that's that's fine but having a sign there you know that's uh, running quite a bit of time especially from a traffic standpoint people are looking to sign it's kind of dangerous coming in and out of where we live right now so I, I would hope that you take all of that in consideration no and we do we do absolutely I appreciate that thank you thanks now again again so we're talking about an ordinance change right now we're not talking about the school we're talking about an ordinance change is there anybody here that has a comment either in support of or in opposition to the ordinance change okay uh, this is a public hearing on that ordinance change so it's not a comment about a big pardon it's not a comment about the sign at this time no okay I'll wait till another time okay mm. sounds good and we do have public comment coming up uh, on the agenda after this too all right uh, anybody else either to have a, uh, any comment in support of or in opposition to the ordinance or any questions on it is there anyone that would like to speak to this? Anyone li would like to speak to this? Move. Anyone who would like to speak to this? Move to adjourn. What? <laughs> Move to close. Shoot it. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a bad idea. Uh, all right, we've got a motion and a second to close the public hearing. All those in favor? Aye. We're not hearing you guys. Aaron's calling them. <laughs> Get your phone. Are they not able to hear? There, now. Can you hear us now? Yes. All right. Gee. Okay. God, I thought I heard a second to that. Somebody had to hear I moved to, uh, to close the hearing. Did... Okay. No second. I've got a motion and second to close the public hearing. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion's approved. Becky, you're off mute. You hear the typing. 
I was wondering what that was. Discussion of possible action on um, on referring drafted amendments to municipal sign code chapter 202-6 sub C and 202-6 sub E to the plan commission for additional review and recommendation. So moved. Second. We got a motion second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Oh, hold on All a second, right. Mr. Mayor. Sorry. Just for clarification, because I don't know the history behind this. Um, what's the origin of the uh, need for an ordinance change? Of the what, Paul? Uh, just with prompting the the ordinance change like what I don't know the history in terms of where this has come from so if somebody could clarify that for me it would be helpful read the notes well uh, and Mike you can chime in here if I miss anything but there are people out there that um, like I said <laughs> that own signs that would like to switch over to um, to electronic and uh, the city is actually looking at that potentially as well with some of the space that we have. Uh, and more importantly is that this really starting, the discussion started to get heightened when COVID started. Uh, and we felt that it would have been great if we had, and we still would continue to be great if we had space for public service announcements. And the people that are interested in converting to electronic signage have pointed out to us that they can coordinate, even if they're using different vendors, they have said that they can all coordinate for the same public service uh, announcement or message. And so it could go across all at the same time. And when you think about some weather instances and things like that for severe weather, uh, thunderstorms, tornadoes, uh, snow emergencies, that kind of thing, so that's, uh, it's, it's kind of started to take on a life of its own given that there are a lot of examples of where we could be using that public service space. That makes sense. I guess under the current ordinance, does it not allow for electronic signs? Mike? It does. Certain size thresholds, um, certain districts, you know, in the B4 <laughs> or B3 district, you know, in the downtown area. Um, there's much, you know, it's more limited. You get the B2, you can have a, a larger signage. Um, we had uh, Ken Talon with SEH, he's their lighting specialist, um, kind of help us work through some of the criteria and how we measure brightness, what's distracting, looking at examples, um, the, all of those things. I think, you know, no good policies made quickly um, I think this is going to take us some time to work through. If you look at that draft ordinance, it has a large blank where it says, you know, max square footage <laughs> in a public district. We, we haven't even arrived at that yet. So we're working on that and it's, it, it'll, it'll take some time. Does that help Paul? Yep. Thank you. I appreciate yep. the presentation. All right. So again, we got a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion's approved. Discussion of possible action on resolution 15-20 declaring intent to exercise special assessment powers under Wisconsin statute 66 or dot 0703 for the 2019 Vine Street reconstruction project. Don't we have a public hearing on that first? What's that? I thought we had a public hearing on it Who's first. Up? Mike? Mike, Mike. Yeah, there's supposed to be a, a open a public yeah. hearing for this mayor, and then uh, supposed to pass the resolution after the public hearing. Perfect. Uh, it's not on the agenda. It's not on the agenda. Shoot the moon. Beg your pardon. <laughs> <laughs> not good. <laughs> Move the table to our next meeting. Second. All right, we got a motion and second to table until the next meeting. All those in favor. Aye. 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 Opposed, motions approved, tabled. Uh, comments and suggestions from citizens present. And again, this is anybody in the room or anybody that would be zooming in. This is your opportunity to talk about anything that you would like. Please keep it short. Uh, and uh, it cannot be um, discussing anything that is on the agenda. We will give you an opportunity to speak to agenda items as they come forth. If anybody is zooming in, once again, please unmute and just chime in when you see an opportunity instead of raising your hand because we can't see you. Is there anybody that would like to make a comment? 
Hi, my name is Celeste Cobral, and I'd like to make a public comment. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, Celeste. Okay, thank you. Um, I have emailed a written public comment and an addendum to it to all of the council members and the mayor. And I'd ask that you read those and enter it into the public record. And also that my previously submitted written public comments for the meetings of August 3rd and July 20th. Also, if you be entered in, into the record, if you do that. Um, I'm not gonna go through all the detail because you can read it and please do. But here are the highlights. Um, COVID-19 cases in St. Croix County have increased by 95% since the council last had on their agenda consideration of any local public health requirements to reduce COVID-19 exposure and spread risks. On July 6th, the council had this item on its agenda. And at that time, the cumulative case numbers in St. Croix mm -hmm. County were 282. Today, they are 551. That's a 95% increase in six weeks. Um, also, there are 17 county residents hospitalized. Uh, seven people in the county have died. And currently, there are um, 138 people in the county still sick. Um, I understand from talking or from correspondence with some council members recently that the city attorney may have prepared a draft ordinance regarding local public health protections against COVID-19. I'm very glad to hear that. I urge you to put it on your agenda and take it up, if not today, at your next <clears throat> meeting. Don't delay. Effective public health protections get ahead of a disease. They don't wait for the disease to infect even more people. You should do take this up sooner rather than later because although there is an emergency order issued by the governor in effect, it went into effect August 1st, it will expire by no later than September 28th unless it's revoked even earlier by a joint resolution of the state legislature. There's not that much time between now and September 28th. COVID-19 is not going to have magically disappeared from St. Croix County or the city of Hudson by September 28th. You need to act sooner rather than later so that you have time to inform people and businesses of what the local public health protections will be and so that you have time to figure out how you're going to enforce those requirements. Just relying on voluntary compliance is not sufficient. The data about Wisconsin as a whole is that only between 30 to 39% of people self-report that they wear a mask every time they go out in public. And the public health recommendations are that you need 95% of people in Wisconsin to be wearing masks all the time, or Wisconsin's going to have to lock down by the end of November. We don't want that. Um, so act sooner rather than later. And in the meantime, please take enforcement action under the governor's emergency order while it is in effect. We don't need more people in our community to get sick, <laughs> to go to the hospital or to die. Thank you. Thank you, Celeste. Are there any other comments? Any other comments? Any other comments? Hearing none, we'll close this portion of the agenda. Consent agenda, and I just want to say in the consent agenda, we are pulling items I and L because they are under new business. Becky, you need to mute again. And we're moving item K <laughs> down to new business. Yeah, so, so just to clarify, I apologize for the confusion on the agenda, but J and L are actually already down on the new under new business. Um, and so J is actually H under new business and L is actually I under new business. Um, but then we need to move K down there as well. So I apologize for that, but we'll get that. We'll talk about our new business. All right. Consent agenda, Becky. Approve the meeting minutes from the August 3rd, 2020 regular council meeting. 
approve the claims in the amount of $939,740.63. Place on file the Public Utilities Commission meeting minutes from July 14th, 2020. Approve amusement device owner's license to Gary Anderson of Twin States Music as listed on the list sheet. Approve operator's license as listed on the list sheet. Approve the Whaley boat purchase for the fire department. Request the Hill City Church to continue to use Lakefront Park band shell for worship services on September 6th, 13th, 20 and 27th of 2020. Approve the change of traffic control at the intersection of Tribute, Tribute Avenue and Red Cedar Pass. Approve a certificate of compliance for C3 Church to operate oh, the church congregation at 529 Second Street. Pull that one in. Yeah, that that, is that the one we're pulling? Okay. Yeah. And then we're pulling J and we pulled K. So approve and always stop at and the intersection. Oh, and L. All okay. right, got it. Sorry. Okay. Approve Deer Crossing sign on West Side of Carmichael Road, South of <coughs> Faith Community Church. Move to approve. Second. Uh, motion and second to approve the consent agenda. Roll call. Morissette? Yes. Alms? Yes. Weber? Yes. Adkins Haggett? Haggett? Yes. Ann Hall? Yes. You missed Dazeel. Okay, do I get to vote? Yeah. <laughs> Just sorry, Dazeel. Yes. <laughs> Motion's approved. Uh, new business. Requ oh, well, wait a minute. Are, everything else is under new business then, right? We're not going back to the, to take any of this stuff up. Uh, is this certificate? that right, Aaron? No, we do need to take up uh, K. C so we need to do I and K. Um, we do need to take those up under new business. You want to take them up right now? I think so. Let's mm -hmm. just do them right away. Do I, then do K. All right. Approve a certificate of it. compliance for C3 Church to operate a church congregation at 529 Second Street, C3 Church. So C3 Church um, submitted a certificate of compliance to operate uh, a church at 529 Second Street. That's the former uh, Doughboys location. Um, it's approximately using 2,200 square feet in the main area with an additional 412 square feet in the lower level. That would be used for their children's programs, um, looking at doing some internal work to the building, um, adding a stage and some walls. Uh, currently about 50 people, they have a goal to increase their um, congregation to approximately 150. Um, traditional uh, church schedule of Sunday morning mass at 1030 along with um, some Wednesday small group um, CCD meetings and then potentially some uh, live acoustic mu music on Friday nights. So they've also included a parking plan with their narrative. Um, there was some discussion at plan commission. I believe it went through with a 4-2 vote. No. Is that correct, Mayor? 3-2. Three, three, two. Two. Three, two. Okay. It was not unanimous. Yep. So with that, I would I was one of the objectors. I don't believe that this is the right spot, prime real estate for downtown business district, and I uh, I voted no for it. And I don't believe we've solved our parking problem. So adding anything else more like that down there just to me doesn't make sense. But my real concern is prime real estate. So I am not in favor of this, uh, and that's. I guess what I said. So I won't be voting for it. Anybody else? Is there a motion? Kathy? No, I've got a question for Kathy. Go ahead. Do we have a... Do we have a uh, is, is there a legal problem with denying this? Because it's a uh, religious expression? No, not necessarily. Or? I mean, is, if it's... Are there any issues legally with denying? Well, it meets the zoning criteria, I assume, right, Mike? Correct. 
Correct. And the parking, correct? The parking was taken into account previously with the Doughboys and Dunn Brothers expansion. Oh, they have done some payment in lieu of, or? I have to go back and look at that specifically in that one. I believe so, but I'm, I can't be sure. It's a rental property. But they still have to pro provide parking. Right, but, yeah. uh, but the owners, I think, when they did the building, did but, the parking. Oh. But remember, they're also Absent you're forgiven if, your, your first 6,000 square feet of space. Oh, okay. I mean, if it meets all the criteria under the zoning ordinance, I don't see a sound basis, and there is some uh, potential constitutional challenge based on, uh, you know, First Amendment rights, religion. And are the parking um, requirements or expectations for this church that much different from what Doughboys was using? No, different times, obviously. Mm -hmm. well, this but is the use, Wednesday. the use itself. This is a Wednesday night, a Friday night, and a Sunday morning. A lot of parking, and they want to go to 150 members. Looking down the road here, we haven't solved the I parking issue. I think they have issue. applicants here to speak to it if they would like to as well. Yeah. Is that what you want right now? Would you guys like to come up? <clears throat> as far as the parking, uh, when we were here at the- hey, Identify yourself, oh, Sorry, Matt Anderson, 493 Highland Drive, Ellsworth, Wisconsin, also the pastor of the church. Um, we'd identified that on Sunday morning, the parking wasn't an issue. And so um, as far as the projection of 150 members, that would be when we'd go to two services. So we'd have one earlier in the morning and then one at 1030. So obviously we don't see a problem uh, with the parking issue at that point. And also I, I said on the Wednesday night, um, it would just be a small group um, or maybe a couple small groups, but the Doughboy, from what I understand, their occupancy was 39 people plus their staff. And so on the midweek, we wouldn't even be up to the numbers that Doughboy Pizza was using. Um, so we technically don't see a problem as well from our standpoint with the parking. What about Friday night? And Friday night would be the same thing. Would be just a small group. What we, what we thought we would do is um, we have a worship team that does some practicing um, for the main service on Sunday, you know, so we were, you know, open the doors up, what have you, uh, if that was acceptable. But that would be the, the usage on a Friday night. Wouldn't be a, a, a full-blown service. Sunday is our time where we're going to have service. Okay. Anybody else? My name is Julie Hefner, and I am um, the realtor who had put these guys together with this space. Um, I just want to address Randy's comment about it not being an appropriate um, business for downtown. And I, uh, well, I want to address a couple things. But it's Sunday morning, and so there's not a lot of other big activity at 8.30 and 10.30 on Sunday morning downtown. I think it's a terrific fit because it brings some diversity to our downtown. It's not another bar, it's not another restaurant, it's not another boutique, you know, that is in, uh, that may get turned over again. It's somebody, they have a, it's a five year lease. So they're planning on staying there for a very long time. They are at 50 members, 20 of those members are children. So we have additional space down uh, downstairs for that. So it's really 30 members. Many of those members are married. And so now you're talking about, and the children obviously aren't driving, right? So now you're talking about maybe 18 cars and we're talking about Sunday morning. They're not holding a Wednesday night service. They're not doing a Wednesday night youth thing. They're talking about small groups. And when your group starts with 30 adults, and 20 children, a small group is a major subset of that, right? So 
the uh, if they did grow, which they want to grow, I hope they do, um, right? So they have in the lease, there's a first right of refusal for them on any additional space that comes available in the building. Uh, if they do grow to m even close to 100, they've said they'll add the second service, which then would be even earlier on Sunday morning. And so I just, I, I would like to look outside of um, parking because I don't see any issues on Sunday morning and down in, in Hudson. And if there were, you know, any, it would certainly not in the majority of the year. And I would welcome, you know, I'm going to find them a space in Hudson somewhere where it doesn't, it, to me, I don't have any um, agenda for, find, for putting them in downtown other than the fact that I love the idea of them having that exposure. I love the idea of a, a wholesome business like that downtown and I like the diversity of it. So I just want to make sure we're clear on the numbers of people that are part of this church right now and what their intent is if they grow. Thanks, Thanks. Julie. Thanks, Rich. Is there anybody else? Any other comments here? Anybody online? Zoom in. in. <clears throat> Council members, questions? Anybody? I don't see um, a problem I, with the I parking I speak. in the morning. And <clears throat> um, I'll say a few things. Uh, being a <clears throat> business owner downtown for the past 20 or so years, um, I, can, I see what comes and goes out of these spaces. And um, I like the idea of diversifying more. Um, I mean, we certainly wouldn't say no if it was going to be a counseling um, center where they wouldn't have people coming in and out. Um, I don't even know that we would have the opportunity to approve or disapprove, you know, a different type of business going in that space. Um, I know I have rental space that I don't, they don't come to city council to ask if they can have their business, you know, located, or if they can rent, have a business. I'm not really sure. Um, it seems that, um, that, I, that I just question why we would question this business going in versus any other business that comes and goes in the downtown neighborhood. But, you know, I see it as a plus. Um, we used to have a church type facility at Third and Vine. It was, something crossings. I know they had food giveaways one one or two mornings a week. That would have caused some traffic. Um, there's the Baptist Church at also Third and Vine. Um, they don't even, I don't even know that they have a parking lot. And so that is a significant Sunday morning um, street parking for that congregation, which I think that church is quite large. Um, Sunday mornings, 1030, I don't see that there's a big pressure on that lot. And it actually might increase the number of people going out to brunch on Sundays, you know, um, after after church uh, for some of the downtown restaurants. I think it's kind of a neat idea and neat use of the space personally. Um, I guess that's all I have to say. Anybody else? Is there a motion? Oh, I'll move I'm to sorry. approve Hang on. the Did certificate of compliance. I'm sorry. Second. Just one second. So we got a motion and a second? Yes, sir. Just go ahead. Uh, identify Kyle, yourself. Kyle Kolbaum, I'm sorry. I'm part of, part of C3 Church. I'm a chiropractor in uh, Ellsworth. Uh, I live at uh, W4083 Ellsworth. I just wanted to say that um, as far as being a business owner and part of this church, uh, Pastor Matt has a history of being uh, president of the uh, Chamber of Commerce in, in, um, in Ellsworth. He was there, what, three or four years? We host um, the Chamber of Commerce meetings at our church. We've done that for about three years. And so <coughs> as we use this space, if we're able to use this space, um, we're very open to be community-minded. Uh, and if, if I'm, I don't know if the chamber would fit in that, in that space or not, but uh, that's the kind of way we look at uh, our our usage is to be a part of the community and try to be be as helpful as we can so thanks okay, thank you any other comments anybody 
All right, we have a motion and a second in front of us. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Aye. Roll call. Aye. Roll call. We have a hard time with some some people unmuting and, and coming in, so we're gonna, every now and then we'll do a roll call. Morissette? No. Alms? Yes. Dazeal? Yes. Weber? Yes. Ekin Target? Yes. Paul? Yes. All right, was that five to one? Motion's, yes. motion's approved. Uh, which one was next? Are we taking up K or? Well, J. Does it matter? Yes. Or K, J? K would be next then. Get that out of the way. Then we can move on to regular new business. All right. Uh, discussion of possible action on traffic safety for O'Keefe and Hanley intersection. This came up at uh, public safety and it's been on our agenda before and as you can see with the report it is recommended also by Dean Chamberlain or whoever reported that that we put a four-way in at O'Keefe and Hanley at the intersection there a four-way stop because of the safety and because of the building up that's happening on the south end of the city lot Lee my Lee properties and the uh, uh, Phillips property, the business park. And it passed out of committee unanimously. I'll move to approve. Second. Motion and second to approve. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. <laughs> okay. Is that five to one? There's another motion on the issue sheet. For reducing the speed. Oh yeah. Is that, did you want to address that? Yeah. No, I just. Oh. Just we just want to make sure we finalize. I haven't. So the motion's approved. Okay. I thought they voted. Go ahead. Uh, well, we're moving down into the new business, and we're starting with A. Is the other one item? Oh, that was part of this issue sheet. That was my uh, question. Did you want to address? We wanted that? it separate. Yeah. Separately. Yeah. Okay. So we also discussed the speed limit on O'Keefe Road, and that speed limit has been requested to be lowered uh, because it was, uh, people are just flying past. Now, we, there was some discussion about, let's work, wait and see with the four-way four stop before we lower the speed, but our chief officer, Jeff Williams, said that we need to probably lower it all at once as uniform. So I'll move that we decrease the speed limit on O'Keefe. Second. Motion is second. Uh, discussion. Yeah. Uh, what is the current speed limit and what is the proposal to lower it to? Jason. Uh, the current, sorry to uh, chime in here. Uh, the current speed limit, I believe, is 35 miles per hour. And the uh, proposed new speed limit would be 25. And I believe that was all the way from Crestview Drive down to Mayor Road. Correct. And if I could chime in for just a second too, um, you know, O'Keefe Road does uh, you know, go by a lot of residential areas. Um, I don't see a need for a speed limit that's greater than 25 miles per hour out there. And in fact, yeah, like public safety, we uh, talked about there, like we don't want people going that fast down there because um, higher speeds in, uh, in an urban environment are not are not good uh, to mix together. So I'm definitely supportive of that uh, action as well. Anybody? So we got a motion and a second. Further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion's approved. Request by Sue Garrity to host a farewell event for John Potter at Lakefront Park on Sunday, September 13, 2020 at 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. I'm here if you have any questions. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually not my request. It's the FIP Center for the Arts. So um, John retired after uh, 35 years as the executive director of the FIPS and 
COVID-19 hasn't allowed us to really let the public say goodbye to him. So we were asking to use Lakefront Park on uh, September 13th in order to do that. Our plan is to just have people walk through as John stays on the band shell. And I think it's all in the plan. So if you have questions, let me know. Vote approved. Second. Motion second to approve. Any discussion? I, I have two comments. Uh, first of all, um, for contact tracing, uh, and we have several events on the list who are doing this, who are recording the people who are there. And I, and I can't remember. Is that is this on your, it your is sign up? On we do intend to require all the people that are, or have a, uh, contact information with all the people that are there, contact list, not only for John, to show who came to say goodbye, <laughs> but also um, to comply with COVID. So it's a twofold um, process for us. Right. Yeah, I just now found it. Uh, you've got you know you have several good good uh, suggestions in there. One is wearing a mask, maintain six right. distance. Uh, if you're not if you don't feel well, don't come. And then right. uh, recording who's there. I think those are the basics out of the CDC. That's what we plan to do. Thank you. And plus, uh, are you you are gui are you guiding the people? Or yeah, helping enforce the uh, six foot. Right, we guide the six have foot about a dozen volunteers there to to set that up and follow through with that. Um, I'm going to ask if we could get some barricades, maybe to just move the line, and that'll help people stay in in a in a uniform uh, line through the front of the band shell. I, I think you've done a good job of of uh, organizing this. Thank you very much, Mr. Weber. Anybody else? Yeah, I just want to say thanks to John for all his years of service. And I think this is a really cool way to honor him. So I really support it, Sue. Good job putting it together. Yeah. Cool. Thank you very much. Anybody else? All right, we got a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion's approved. Request by Chris Chornahoy, St. Croix Valley Community Band to perform at Lakefront Park Band Show on Sunday, October 4th, 2020. Uh, rain date to be October 11th, 2020. Is Chris here from the St. Croix Valley Community Band? She was no. on. If not, I can start and she can chime in. Uh, they're looking to perform uh, like Mr. Mayor said, on Sunday, October 4th, 2020. Um, they're going to have 25 members of the band set up in the band shell, socially distanced um, per the St. Croix County guidelines. They're expecting between, you know, on their application it says 50 people estimated, but uh, there'll be people, you know, in the park. I'm sure that'll, that'll see them setting up and uh, want to come and listen. It says uh, musicians will play for 50 minutes. Um, they will have volunteers provided by the band, making sure that the uh, listeners and people in the audience do stay six to 10 foot distance um, apart. Um, may I so just- They're also gonna log the, the people that are watching and the musicians present as well for contact tracing. Correct. Yep. Can I just make a comment? Um, Kind of sorry to have to say this, but I reviewed the governor's uh, order on wearing face masks. And um, what it says is it's required in any enclosed space. And the definition of enclosed space includes outdoor park structures. Um, there's no guidance in terms of what kind of structures that applies to. Um, the band shell is a structure, and I just point that out uh, to the council. Like I said, there's no guidance. It's a little bit vague. Um, it could be interpreted as your typical park shelter, which would be more enclosed as opposed to a band shell, but it doesn't say that. It just says park structures. Um, this is Celeste Cobral. Can I just briefly suggest that you go to the governor's website and look at the frequently asked 
questions regarding his emergency order number one issued July 30th because there is some elaboration on what is considered an enclosed space. Do you have that available to you? Because I haven't looked at it, to be honest. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm not sure who's speaking, but... Um, this is Catherine just... Mankittrick, the city attorney. Okay, um, let me find you on here and I can send it to you in a text. I can send you the link if that's what you want. Well, what, why don't I just review it and you can, um, if you are concerned about that, that could be a condition on whatever decision you make for the council. Yeah, I was just mentioning that because um, it is addressed and you were saying that you couldn't find any guidance on it. Mm -hmm. um, it says that um, enclosed spaces, what does an enclosed space mean? I'm reading from it now. Enclosed space means a confined space that is open to the public where individuals congregate. For example, a rideshare vehicle is an enclosed space, but a private car is not an enclosed space because, it's, because it is not open to the public. Um, if there's somebody else there who's not from your household, wear a face covering. Here are examples. Enclosed spaces include outdoor bars, outdoor restaurants, taxis and rideshare vehicles, public transit, outdoor park structures, which is what you were talking about, mm -hmm. stadium or bleacher seating, boats that are open to the public, for example, a tour boat or a ferry. An enclosed space does not include outdoor playgrounds, trails, bike paths or hiking paths, outdoor parking lots, enclosed spaces that are not open to the public. That's as much as they've got for you. So it doesn't really address outdoor park structures. Well, 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 it's included it's, it's, it's in the definition, outdoor. but it doesn't say whether a band shell, which is open on one side, whether that's included in an outdoor park structure, which is part of the definition. Yeah, outdoor park structure is given as an example. It doesn't define it. Right. I would think that your band shell would be an outdoor park structure, so perhaps you're, but there are exceptions um, that your face covering requirements um, in the order uh, that include like making presentations of a sort of dramatic performance. That's by a single person. Yeah, I've got the order. It's just that okay. there's no elaboration on what they meant by outdoor park structure, except for okay. the playground type things. Okay, I got it, thank you. Thank you, Celeste. You're welcome. Chris did just, uh, Chris did just chat in or chime in saying that the musicians will be wearing masks. Oh. I don't know how that's possible, but uh, <laughs> they're going to play their trumpet through their mask. Okay. I don't have any comment on that. That's not my yeah, area I don't of know. expertise. I don't know how that would work. I mean, they could avoid it by playing, you know, just not using the band shell and just being on the flat right in front of the band shell, then there's no issue. They're outdoors, they're not on the structure. How many members? Does it matter? 25. 25 well, they'd have to do the social distancing, but they'd have to do that anyway. Yeah, but doesn't the order say that you can remove your face covering when you're giving a religious, political, media, educational, artistic, cultural, musical, or theatrical presentation for an audience so long as you have at least six feet between you and other individuals? So I think as long as single they are individual by six feet, they should be fine not having their mask on. Well, it talks about a single individual is giving a religious, political, media, educational, artistic, cultural, musical, or theatrical presentation. So I'm reading the FAQ and it doesn't have that distinction. Well, this it is just... right in the order. Huh. Okay. I have a question. If the, since the band shell is not itself, will not be open to the public, it'll only be open to the musicians, would hmm. that be a way of giving it an approval? Well, I think it was intended, I mean, you could say the same for a park shelter, and I think it's intended to apply to a park shelter, and once that's rented, I mean, it's available to the public to use. So as long as they set up in front of the band shell instead of inside the band shell, that would be okay. That would avoid the issue, yep. 
I'll move to approve with that recommendation. Second. Got a motion, second to approve with the with that the limitation. Uh, further discussion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed. Motion's approved. Request by Addison Filatro to hold an event at Lakefront Park on Monday, September 14th, 2020. So again, this is another. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. I was just going to say we sent out the application and the packet got doubled up. Unfortunately, it was the one before it again. So we did email the council the actual application. So hopefully, you had a chance to take a look at that um, and see it, um, just because we inadvertently, like I said, included the previous application for this agenda item as well can you give a brief summary here and i wasn't able to see that today okay so let me get it on my screen here hold on one second um okay so um description of the event uh city conversation on inclusion diversity and law enforcement where council members and chief willems are present this is not hosted by city council it is hosted by addison filatro City council members are not required to answer questions and it is a listening session for them. There will be two socially distanced tables at the band shelf for city council members to sit at. Attendees will be asking questions or bringing their experiences forward for council members and Chief Willems to listen to. Um, dates and hours, September 14th, 6.30 to 8 uh, p.m. Estimated number of people attending 100 to 200. Uh, plans to limit um, number of people, uh, whatever it says, will comply with public health recommendations for COVID. Um, they will clean up after themselves. And that's, I'm trying to go through it all and make sure I missed anything. That's pretty much the details part of it. And then are people being required to wear masks at this, Addison, or do we know? Yes. Well, I would, I don't know how I can fully enforce it, but yes, is the, it's on the event flyer. Hmm. Addison, will you have uh, any volunteers like the two previous uh, events we just discussed helping with the distancing? Um, my plan was to set up little flags that I could put in the grass and then take out when it's done to measure out. And my husband so kindly said he would help me. <laughs> I think it's a super important community event for us. So I would move to approve. I'll second. Okay. The, the second one other piece that I've liked in the other two events was the ability to have a log. I guess you, if you could have perhaps ask people to sign in that's fine yeah um i'd like to make just a few comments i have some concerns about uh the council sitting up in the um band shell because to me that conveys more of an image of a council holding a public hearing on this which is not what's happening and um so I, I would prefer actually if the person hosting the event would be in the band shell and have a microphone and the council can choose to uh, be wherever they want as attendees instead of kind of giving the impression that it's a public hearing. And um, then the person holding the event can call up whatever, I don't know how they're planning on the speakers, but whoever wants to speak can then come up to the microphone and speak. I just, I just think it looks like the convening of a meeting, even if it's not intended to be that way, when someone walks into that area and the council is sitting in at tables in the band shell, it just looks more like the convening of a meeting and holding a public hearing in front of the council. and. Um, that's not what it's intended to be. Can I respectfully respond? Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry, but <laughs> okay, one, all of your city council members, people don't even know who some of you are. Like, it's really important for people to actually have a face to the people that they are addressing. 
I don't really, okay. I understand your concerns, but like, this is a really important thing that the city needs to be listening to. It, I'm having to host this and ideally in an ideal world, I shouldn't have been having to host this. Like this should have, okay. I'm sorry, I'll take a, a <laughs> okay. I'm, but anyway, my point is, is that this is something that needs to be seen as something that the city wants to listen to. And if they're not actually visible and are just sitting wherever, then that's, that's the gist of what I have to say. Mm -hmm. Am I understanding, Addison, if I'm right, is this is a listening session, correct? Is that? Yep, and you don't have to respond to anything. It says that on the flyer. Um, it yep. says that, like, people are just bringing their concerns and questions and possible experiences. Um, I, yep. And that's what I wrote in the event page, um, that this would just literally be a listening session, don't expect answers. Yep, and I think that makes a lot of sense. I'm totally willing to do it. I think it's super mm -hmm. important. I also think that helps us get kind of um, some clearance with the Wisconsin open meeting laws, because we're not really saying anything. We're just there to listen. So I think that helps us comply. So I would, I would stand by the motion as um, originally proposed by Addison. And, and as far as the open meeting law goes, I mean, we'll post it um, as a meeting where um, a quorum of the council may be in attendance but no public, um, no, no public business or no public, no actions will be taken. Um, so we'll make sure we're covered that way as well. And it's important then too that it is just listening, not um, answering questions and engaging because then it looks more like a meeting than a, sponsor, a separately sponsored event. Yeah, I have a problem with that. It's, it's like we're there and what are we really doing? Are we, are we paying any attention? So if we, if we aren't able to engage and ask questions or ask for clarification, and we won't be able to do that on, on all of this, but there may be some uh, really important things where we need clarification. So I, I wouldn't want to be handicapped by that. Well, what you're doing is information gathering. I mean, that's the point of this um, and You can't gather event. information without asking questions. Well, you can then put it on a later meeting and ask your clarification questions and discuss it as a council. But see, that's the difficulty with the way it's being set up. It's, it's really set up more like a meeting than just a public event where people can speak their, whatever they, concerns or experiences, whatever, they have on their minds about these topics. Okay. Is there a second? No. All right, we've got a motion. Is there a second? I seconded it. Okay, sorry, missed that. Uh, we've got a motion and a second. Further discussion? Um, I just want to know, are we doing this with the limitations that you just... Um, that's not in the motion. Well, except that the actual application states that um, council members aren't required to answer questions. It's a listening session, so I would, I would strongly urge you not to ask questions or answer questions and do what they're asking is listen. I think that makes sense. And then I think if there's follow up, we can put it on the agenda for a future meeting and mm -hmm. discuss and ask questions and bring in more folks to talk. So I think this is the first step toward just listening to the community. That's why I think it's so important. Okay. What is this predicated on? Uh, um, you want to ask that? Uh, yeah. What is this whole thing predicated on? What was there an issue or something? Um, well, I 
organized the march and there was quite a bit of pushback from the community that was there about um, how the city council doesn't always listen, that they, um, that there are definitely issues with law enforcement in the community um, and it, like people literally asked for a city council list listening session. Um, so that's where this is coming from. And as I presented before, like there were a lot of signatures on the petition that I made. Um, so it isn't just me, I guess. Randy, we did talk about this before at council and then uh, we gathered the best possible date for as many of us to, that could be there. What? Yes, it's, so. it's not a totally new subject for us. Telling you. I also think the average citizen can be really intimidated by council chambers. Mm -hmm. And I think it's good to go out and meet them on common ground, like at the band shell. Mm -hmm. I think that's really good precedence or policy or just a one-time thing, whatever you want to call it, uh, that could open up some communication. So, I mean, uh, my hope is we just get more information. We, we understand what's happening in the community and, and then we have the chance to follow stuff up or to deal with stuff kind of as we see fit after that, so. Addison, you might think about how that stage is set up. Uh, tables are become a barrier. So I'm not sure we want to have tables, maybe just chairs. Okay. What is, does anybody else think about that? I agree about the barrier, but I think that I agree about the barrier, but I think that it would be helpful to have a place where we can take some notes. Mm -hmm. Okay, good point. Will we be recording this? Yeah. <laughs> the Vera Channel agreed to come as well as um, Herb Town's newspaper. Okay, uh, anybody else? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Okay, um, Sarah, I just wanna make sure you, you, that was a vote against? Uh, no, it was a vote for. Okay. Um, I was. I had a, a final comment, and then we went into a vote. So I was just going to thank um, Addison for the work she's done on this. I know that um, anything that you're trying to do to be a community leader from, um, you know, from being a constituent is a very difficult um, thing to do. It's putting your neck out there, and I just want to thank her for her involvement to try to circle this wagon and initiate this conversation. Okay. Thanks, Sarah. All right, so motion's approved. Review the safety plan for the Drew Whiskey event plan for September 19, 2020 at Lakefront Park. Yep, we can pull that one from the agenda. They've canceled their event. Oh, In fact, okay. this morning they let us know. Request by Gary Bird, Metro Brass Quintet to perform at Lakefront Park Band Show on, is this the same one that we heard? No? Oh no, that was torn away. Um, to perform at Lakefront Park Band Show on Saturday, August 22nd, 2020 at 6 p.m. with a rain date of Sunday, August 23rd, 2020. So we have another band request to utilize Lakefront Park, um, Metro Brass Quintet. It is a 12 piece Metro Brass Band. Um, they don't have anything that says an estimated number of people, um, but I would assume it'd be, you know, roughly the same amount, 100 to 200 people, so. Uh, I'm a little disturbed that we don't have any uh, application for it to, that would help to find that. But I think we need to uh, have the same requirements for, of them that they have masks, that they, you know, that they, they require masks, expect masks, that they do distancing. 
you know, a log would be great, hard to do, but this is a different time. This is not a... And be on the flat. Be on the flat. That's yeah. what's recommended for gatherings. So, I'm sorry, was that a motion? Did you also want to include the be on the flat portion of the lawn in front of the band shell as you did for the other musical concert? Because of the makes, mask order? I think that makes sense, Kathy, given the ambigu ambiguity yeah. of the, the uh, how the state order was written. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think we I think we have to. All right. Mm -hmm. Can can we uh, try to delve into that and see if we can get a better? Yes, yeah, I'll I'll actually that, contact that really, the health for department. A band that really detracts from their sound yeah i yeah it's, it's it's interesting because like kathy's correct you read the order and it says individuals doing xxx yeah. but the faq does not say anything about individuals at all so yeah we'll we'll, we'll dig into it yeah and out. if it can be you know if if their interpretation like the health departments is different then we'll let you know Okay, was that, uh, Jim, was that a motion? Sure, let's make that a motion. Okay, so we got a motion. The band performing on the flat, uh, it, and unless the staff is able to determine that it's appropriate for them to mm -hmm. be in, in the band shell. Sounds good. Okay, and was there a second then? Uh, second, but a question for Jim. Jim, did you want to require uh, the log and the uh, mass as well as part of that? Yes. Okay. Sounds good. I would second. All right, we've got a motion and a second. Further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion's approved. Request by Andy Hayes to use Lakefront Park on Tuesday, August 25th, 2020 at 6.30 p.m. to provide members of the River City Corral to perform outside. Yep, so this isn't, uh, as Andy put it in the uh, issue sheet, that it's, it's not a concert. It's just an outlet for singers uh, to express their art in a socially distanced outdoor location. Uh, they plan to have a, a piano player, uh, three to four people with microphones using the band shell to lead some outdoor singing. Uh, ask that all singers socially distance themselves in the park, you know, 10 feet from other non-family members. Music would not be handed out. Um, they'd be available digitally upon request. So uh, looking for a motion to approve uh, this event on August 25th starting at 630. I have some uh, thought on this and it's just a concern is that uh, from my reading of the CDC guidelines, um, singing is actually one of the most uh, dangerous things you can do in COVID. And so, for instance, I work at a church and there is no, no singing. We just do instrumental music. Um, the other concern was that uh, on the bottom of that issue sheet, it, it says that they are encouraging people they want people from the public basically to stop by and engage in the singing. And that to me is just kind of a red flag. Um, this is one that I don't think we should approve just based on um, the current CDC guidelines. It's different than instrumental. Mm -hmm. I have nothing against singing on a normal year. I'd love to go, go and do it. Um, but I just don't know if this is a safe one to approve given the research on singing being one of the most dangerous activities you can do to spread COVID. Dr. Paul. Oh, Andrew Hayes, I see you checked in yep. there. <laughs> I'm here, can you hear me? Yep. So uh, yes, first of all, uh, singers would have masks. Uh, on the bottom of that sheet, I'm not quite sure why it said we would encourage others to stop and join. That is not the intent of this event. The event is only for members of the corral to sing outside. Um, and, and Paul, you are right. Um, singing does project more droplets than uh, than speaking. Um, but if you look at the study provided by the University of uh, Boulder, Colorado, it really is no different than um, some of the brass ense uh, ensembles and brass instruments that you're also approving for these events. Um, in some of those uh, cases, they also ask that those instruments be masked, the bells uh, and whatnot. Um, I would expect maybe around 50 people showing up. Uh, like I said, it's not a concert. It's an opportunity for uh, the singers of the chorale to to sing, something we haven't been able to do in buildings. Um, and I think an outdoor event, uh, well distance, uh, space between singers, keeping a log, just like all the other events, I think um, would certainly be appropriate. 
And Andy, just Andrew, sorry, just to clarify, they, the singers would all be wearing masks while they're singing. Is that what you're saying? I would, I would, you know, I would re request that they would have masks on, but of course, we wouldn't be able to enforce that. But we would certainly ask that they would have a mask on. So, how would you not be able to enforce it? Well, I, I guess it'd be no different than. Uh, in any other public situation outdoors, if someone's walking by you without a mask, who's going to be there to enforce that? I mean, we can certainly request that they put their masks on, but we're not gonna put us in a situation where we wouldn't feel comfortable confronting individuals. I thought, are these your singers or these, this is Correct. your- Correct, yeah, they are, they are. So I'm talking about those folks on the stage, so to speak, would be- They wouldn't be on stage. Oh. The, there would be three to four uh, singers that would have microphones uh, in the front part of the stage with a piano. All of the actual corral members would be in the grass area on the park, socially distanced. And you're talking about the, anybody from the public you're saying who shows up? For no, the that's incorrect. Uh, the singers in the organization, to allow the singers in the organization an opportunity to come and sing. Just to be clear, you're saying that if the singers come up, show up, excuse me, and don't have a mask, that you wouldn't be able to enforce them to wear a but, mask before they sing? No, we would, we would certainly ask them to, to put on a mask um, if they refuse. You know, I, I could certainly take um, your opinion as to how to enforce that, absolutely. Well, they're not going to be in the band shell, correct? Correct, all of the so singers would be out in the grass area. So the order would not apply to the singers. They're outdoors, not in the structure. I agree with Paul that this seems um, concerning unless you require them to, and as a leader, um, Andy, I would think that you would be able to enforce a mask. Absolutely, I mean, we would certainly ask them to wear a mask, you know, and I can certainly take direction from you, um, but if we're in a situation where we're out there and let's say 10 people don't have a mask on and I ask them to put a mask on, how, how would you like me to proceed? Well, I'm saying that the singers, you would require the singers to wear a mask while they're singing. Correct. And that if they refuse to wear a mask, that they wouldn't be allowed to perform. Oh. They're outside. They, so what I, but they're outside, not in the band, shell, band shelter. Yeah, the order does not, the state, Governor Evers' order does not apply to them because they're not in the structure. Now, you could require the four, if Correct. they're singing at the same time, um, they would need to wear a mask, but the singers who are outside the structure, just outside, are not required to wear a mask under Governor Evers' order. So while they're singing, they should be wearing a mask. Yeah, so I can certainly have those three or four leaders um, having, you know, wear a mask, but I'm talking about the individuals that would be on the grassy area of the park. Um, if that's not part of the structure, obviously, according uh, to your lawyer, it says that they don't necessarily have to have a mask on then. But they wouldn't be stinging at that time, so then that would be a lower risk. They would be singing. It sounds like they would be singing. Yeah, I, I have no problem with music. I just want to be really clear, but I'm gonna motion that we actually deny this um, request for the public singing in the park simply based on CDC safety guidelines and that alone. I'll second. We got a motion and second to deny. Further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. 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 The motion does not prevail, does not pass. Um, anybody else? Have a motion. Move to approve. Second. Motion is second to approve. Discussion? 
with uh, I would say we need to require that the uh, at least at minimum the singers have to be wearing masks because they're projecting droplets now they're they're beyond the aerosol which is less of an issue outside droplets are still an issue outside that's fine I'll put that in the motion and I'm pretty sure Mr. Haas has the intelligence to do the right thing correct <laughs> but that's not the singers outside does that work uh, well, can we also add something about um, trying to take, um, you know, um, attendance, uh, you know, logging who's there? Correct. I would be uh, requesting them to actually sign up in advance and then double check okay, the when they arrive. Perfect. Can I have clarification on the singers that are the leaders in the front as opposed to the singers in the grass area of the park wearing masks? I just want to make sure that we're on the same page. Well, my thought is they should all be wearing masks. Mr. Haas and Paul, I mean, by all the governor's orders, they could be outside as long as they're social distancing without a mask. I get that. We need to follow the safer CDC guidelines. The governor's orders aren't comprehensive in every the, single situation. We need some common sense here. So I'm simply saying the CDC guidelines are telling us that singing is one of the most dangerous ways to spread COVID-19. So I'm simply saying, let's err on the side of caution. All the singers should be wearing masks, whether they're outside, inside, doesn't matter to me. Mm -hmm. I agree. You don't have any policy or anything like that to base that requirement on. Right, we're only basing it on the science from the CDC, which is the best science we have at this point. There's no order. There's no. You, but you have no authority to enforce that kind of an, a requirement. You, it's not in the park policies. It's, it's just kind of on an ad hoc basis. Yeah, we're in the middle of a pandemic, and I appreciate the point, but we're trying to make the best situation or best decisions we can make for public safety we're, we're all in new territory here and, and kathy i mean it, it is our park i mean technically i think the council can do it's outside i mean regardless of policy or not when they're approving a use of it i mean they can put whatever requirements they'd want on for that use since it's a city park or do we have to have well them i mean somehow detailed somewhere else I mean, I, I, I understand what you're saying completely, and I get that part. Um, but at the same time, I don't know about tying the council's hands on a decision of a city facility or a, or something like that when, Let me when they're withdraw determining my motion. Uh, or approving uses. Let me withdraw the motion and remake a motion. I move to approve the event as as noted in our packet and not requiring but to follow the governor's rules and how Catherine has outlined the issue. Everybody understand that motion? No. Clarify that, would you please, Randy? No. Just, you're, you want to pro move to approve the event as presented. Correct, following the governor's orders of outside yes. distancing. Consistent with Does that include the, the log? I, I don't know if, if that's they're good, willing to do if it. they're willing to sign it but yeah okay. i wouldn't require anybody to have to uh, whatever if you want to all right so, everybody understand that motion <laughs> yeah is there a second so i seconded it before are you not requiring the log randy in this motion if we need to have the log to get the event to have it, go ahead. I'll, I'll put that in the motion. Does the log include the people who will be just dropping in as well? Uh, will they be asked to sign in? I think that that's important as well. Well, you tell me. I mean, you guys have made it uh, to be consistent. You have everybody else signing in. Where's that going? Who's it going to? You guys seem to have all the answers when it comes to this pandemic. Jesus, Randy. Yeah, that's that's not true, and you know it. 
where they would keep the log in case that the we find out that COVID struck you know a number of people who were at the event then the event coordinator would have the log and be able to turn it in to authorities that could make communication known to the people who were also in attendance there's a purpose for keeping track of social groups andy any comment and on it's the log? not that we have the answers we're using common sense andy any comment on the log like i said we could certainly uh, keep a log of the singers that are present absolutely but what about the public if they drop in would you be able to we would have to have them? a separate location for them to sign in should they do that again uh the purpose is for uh, the corral members to do this, but I understand there'll be uh, pedestrians probably walking by, and if they decide to participate, I would ask that they would log in. So, Bill, yes, I'll add it to the motion. And I'll I'll keep my second from before. So, second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? I guess, uh, where's the, where are we with the mask issue? We're now inconsistent. the governor's order right as the governor's order no it's consistent with the governor's order I'll say that it, oh, we are the, consistent with what we've been doing it's consistent with the governor's order and what you've done for the other uh con musical events that they be on the flat and outside the structure so that the governor's order doesn't come into play that's what you've done for the two uh, musical events the people my understanding is the people in the band shell will wear masks while they're in the band shell mm -hmm. the other events didn't have people singing from the audience no they're all outside they're playing their musical instruments on the flat outside the structure which is what this event is also proposing to do. Anybody else? All right, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Nay. 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 I'm sorry, can we get a roll call on that? Those in favor? Aye. Marset? Yes. Alms? Yes. Dezeo? No. Uh, Weber? No. Atkins Hoggett? Mm, this is really a tough uh, <laughs> Yes. And Hall? No. Hold on this. That's a 3-3. All right, so right now we got a 3-3 tie. I have a, uh, I have a dilemma here in that uh, Andy Hayes is my son-in-law. And um, so my question is, as long as everybody knows I am declaring my conflict, may I still, may I vote? And I think we're gonna get some guidance here in a moment. take a couple minute break that's okay with everybody anybody need to get up and uh, do anything move around okay. Well, your 
personal interest is defined over personal interest arising from blood or marriage relationships, whether or not any financial interest is involved. Mm. All right. Guidance from counsel would indicate that uh, a conflict of interest means, in this case, that I cannot vote. Yeah, I and I agree with that too, Kathy. It's it's pretty clear in the ordinance. All right. So the motion uh, fails for lack of a majority. Uh, all right. Um, discussion of possible action on Lakefront Park boat launch redesign. All right, good evening, Council. Mr. Mayor, uh, in your packet or in front of you, there's a final design of the lakefront boat launch project put together by Foth. They originally presented to Park Board back in February and got a bunch of ideas from Park Board. And out of that meeting, they drafted an 80 stall option, a 60 stall option and then an option to the south side of the Buckeye garage. And then of course on the table was the, the current layout. Uh, those options were taken to the Lakefront Review Committee uh, just for some initial reaction. And right off the get-go, the 80 stall option uh, was, was kicked out just because you know it, it intruded too far north into the park. It would have went uh, all the way to the volleyball courts and based upon kind of initial conversations with park board and uh, general public at our, at our first meeting when this was introduced was trying to conserve as much park space on the park space on the south side of the, the park as possible. So throughout this entire process, both the park board and the lakefront review committee have had that in mind. And, you know, they, they wanted to, you know, keep that, keep that in the forefront of their mind that when they're finalizing this design. So um, like I said, in front of you, this was brought to park board uh, at the last park board meeting and there was some discussion on some of the, the layout traffic layouts so on and so forth but um, it was passed unanimously the 54 stall option and it is in front of you tonight for final approval if this is approved the fourth engineering will put together uh, final design uh, with construction drawings they would go out for permit for the through the dnr then they would also start applying for the grant funding with a proposed timeline of construction if the grant is awarded in summer or fall 2021. Um, I'm here to answer any questions, um, so fire away. Anybody? Mike, I have a couple questions. Uh, first of all, uh, how far does this how much park space do we lose because of this how far does this extend from the uh, current design yep so the, the, it would extend another approximately 100 feet to the north of the current curb line there's a there's a huge cottonwood on the south side of the volleyball courts and uh that was conserved uh, as part of this design we didn't want to go any further north of that a lot of the trees that it would impact are small enough that they'd be able to be replanted or replaced either in the park or in some of those median islands as part of the design. Um, so it's, that's the answer. Okay. Second question is, I see the, the entrance or the exit now is going to be on first street, right in the, right. Correct. The there. That's a little, I just drove through there and there are cars parked on all sides and that's kind of narrow, right? And I, I felt it was, it was narrow. And yep. uh, my question, whether some of these larger rigs are going to be able to really maneuver there. So Absolutely. I'm yeah, that, that came up in, in our conversations with the Lakefront Review Committee, and we expressed that same concern to Foth. Uh, their answer was, is they can widen that exit, is why, you know, widen it even further in order to allow some of those turning movements from those rigs. And they have, they have software, right, where they put in, you know, a, a 18 foot truck with a 24 foot trailer this is the the turning radius you need now obviously if there's cars coming in either direction that person's not going to be able to pull out right i mean they're going to have to wait until both sides of the road are clear in order to do so and in order to kind of alleviate some of that traffic congestion is an idea was brought up to allow only right hand turning movements out of there so you're not getting that that cross traffic going to the north too so that was a suggestion that would probably help alleviate some of that too. Yeah, yeah that's a good idea. Nope. 
And the, the third question is, I didn't see any kind of cost estimate. Yep. So uh, preliminary cost estimates, um, you know, this project is going to cost the city between one and 1.5 million. A majority of that would be covered through grants provided by the DNR. Um, there's some invasive species grants, there's the waterway grant, uh, local recreational grant, uh, and then any other remaining monies would be funded out of um, TID. Okay, and then re relative to that, what's this next step going to cost? I mean, this is, we're, this is, isn't even about the construction, this is just about all the, all the pre-work, the design and the uh, yep. moving ahead with permits and that sort of thing. Then there's yes. million and a half for construction. Right, million and a half for construction. The next, the next phase, phase two from fourth, um, if I recall off the top of my head, that's design, that's permitting, that's the grant writing. It was around sixty thousand dollars, but if approved tonight, that would have to come back to a following city council meeting for for approval to move forward into phase two. I thought we were already under contract with them for for this phase two work. Is that not right? No. So it was just phase one. Um, so it's preliminary design. There is some permitting uh, in there, but that's not you know full detailed construction drawings. It's not the grant writing. It's not following through with the actual construction of the boat ramp facility. Okay, okay thanks. Did we have a motion? No. I don't think so. I would move to uh, approve. I'll second that. We got a motion, second to approve. Further discussion? Yeah, I, I do have some concern about losing 100 feet of the park, um, that's pretty hard to regain. So um, that, uh, I, I, don't like to, I don't like to lose open land anywhere we can. So um, I, I'm conflicted on this. I see the value. I see some of the value. I'm not a boater, don't have a boat. But uh, there, is, there is some down, certainly some downside to this. Mike, can you can you talk about the other designs and kind of how that was scaled back? That might help. I have, I have the same concern, Jim. But Mike, you want to talk about the south part of on Buckeye there, and then also what the other bigger design was? Yeah. So on this, I didn't include it, but um, Fort did put together a design for the south side of Buckeye. Uh, it would basically be uh, located where the playground is now, and some of the problems that we would run into is a a lot of mature trees down there. Uh, permitting through the DNR for an additional ramp uh, and some of the grade challenges at that location and the amount of stalls that would have been picked up on that south location would have only been 13. So, it, you know, from full standpoint, it really wasn't worth pursuing that and then just traffic flow in and out of that launch facility. Um, and then the, the larger scale one, the 80 stall, like I had mentioned before, I mean, that would have went all the way up past the volleyball court. So, and the exit would have been out kind of in the parking stalls area. So, you know, that the lakefront view me said, you know, it's just not feasible at this, at this point in time to do that launch, that design, that 80 stall design, just because of A, the amount of space that it did take up to Jim's point and B, losing more parking spaces, which we know is in, in dire need in, in Hudson here. So that's why this was settled on. And in fact, you know, it, it was a 60 stall and they pared it down to 54, tried to squeeze things up as much as they could without intruding too far north into the park and improving some of the traffic flows. Uh, this is a, you know, we, we all know this is a low area. How much is this, is this lot going to have to be raised to uh, keep it functional up to flood stage? Yep, so if, if you're familiar with the launch right now, on the, on the far east side of the launch, that would be pretty much the height of the new launch when it's constructed so it it would raise up you know a couple feet but it wouldn't go any higher than that far east side of the lot it's not like we're raising it five feet by any means i do like what it appears that uh looking at the at the map that the uh the trail is going to be or pathway is going to be on both sides of the uh, lot 
if I'm reading that correctly. Yep, you're right. So life is good. I mean, that's a positive, certainly a positive ad. It will help uh, pedestrian crossing at first and Buckeye. Absolutely. And my Jim, I also <clears throat> go ahead, Paul. Well, my, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, Mike. Um, some of those yeah. small green spaces in the in the parking lot there with the boat lot would would that have um, like any plants or any small trees or something like that? Yep. So the when Forth designed this, they wanted to try and you know include as much green space as possible because they are taking up some of the park. So. You're correct, Paul. Those islands, uh, some of the grassy medians shown in the plan, would in, would include some trees, um, ornamental grasses, so on and so forth. Probably some newer impervious surface type of materials to comply with the DNR runoff standards. Um, but we're trying to not make it look like just a big old parking lot in our in our beautiful lakefront park, right? Try and soften it up as much as possible. I wanted to make a comment to Jim that, you know, I, sh I definitely share the concerns about chewing up green space or, you know, and uh, reducing that part of the park. I guess um, in, in my reviews of this and the many different um, presentations that FUF came up with, um, this part of the park, the, the hundred or so feet that we're losing, is so many times underwater and I so many times see that part of the park underutilized because it's really, um, it hasn't, it's not the greatest part of the park. Um, it's low, the grass doesn't grow that well um, and, and really saving the, saving the mature trees and being able to move the smaller ones. Those were kind of some of the reasons why I, you know, the give and take of um, having the, the Upside is that you know our boat launch will be utilizable uh, even in high water, and that was you know kind of important to me. And this design is the one that changed the way that the changed the directions that the trailers are parked. So I think it, they really worked hard to minimize the footprint even as they increased capacity. So those were some of the things I found. Um, very positive about this particular option. Anybody else? All right, we got a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion's approved. Discussion possible action on 9th Street safety issues. Dean on. Do you, you want to do it? I'm here. <laughs> this came out of public safety and a citizen concerned at our last council meeting. Go ahead, Dean. Yeah, so a little bit of backstory. Like Randy said, uh, we, there was a concerned citizen that uh, a while ago, I think even last year, had uh, forwarded some, some concerns to the council uh, on public safety. Uh, subsequently, uh, Chief Willems, um, uh, I did a, uh, a speed study out on 9th Street um, just, to, just to see what, uh, get some background information, see what's going on out there. I believe the uh, summary of the speed study is in your packet, but uh, just uh, to summarize, um, it does show, uh, in my estimation anyway, that there is a concern for speeding on 9th Street. Um, the average uh, person, the average speed on that that street where the, the speed measurement was taken is, is at the speed limit. So that means that half of the people on the road are, are speeding essentially. And uh, this being located in a, uh, in a residential area, I'm sure there's lots of pedestrians, especially considering it's somewhat close to not only the high school, but also, you know, elementary schools to the West as well. I mean, I would, if it were my neighborhood, I would want uh, people not to be speeding through there either. So. Um, 
So that's kind of the background information. So, so uh, came to public safety. Uh, we talked about it uh, last month. Public safety committee uh, uh, asked me to look into uh, installation of one or more stop sign, always stop signs along uh, ninth. Um, which I did. However, um, I will say that um, I do not believe that an always stop sign is is warranted. Um, always. Always stops are not speed control measures, and I, if you read the uh, the uh, summary of the, the warrants in my agenda item. Um, essentially, always stops put in the wrong locations can have a, a lot of adverse effects. Um, for instance, they uh, uh, if people stop a stop sign, uh, they can speed after the stop sign even more than they were before to make up for lost time. Uh, especially those, you know, people if people are being reckless through there right now. Uh, I can see them continuing to be reckless in that regard. Um, compliance with non-justified stop signs is poor. Um, there's a lot of people that will do a rolling stop or fail a stop at all uh, going through a stop sign since they don't expect to see any traffic on the side street. Um, so, uh, I, uh, yeah, and you can read the rest of the, the summary there, but those are the two major ones I wanted to bring up. Um, so uh, that being said, you know, the, the committee asked me to look at the, the potential for stop signs. Uh, if you were to install, you know, one stop sign, uh, always stop sign, located midway through that corridor, uh, midway point would be at Pitt Street. Um, if you were to look at two intersections for always stop signs, uh, Orange and Fillmore would probably be uh, the best. Um, but uh, then again, I I do not recommend putting an always stop sign along this corridor because I don't believe that's the solution for this. Uh, if I may suggest, um, I think uh, it might be worth us con uh, talking more about this at the next public uh, works committee to talk through some maybe alternatives or uh or at the public safety committee whatever council uh decides um because i don't want to you know have a knee-jerk reaction to a legitimate problem uh that's out there so that's what i'll say about that there was no recommendation from public safety pending the data we got from jeff willems and dean's analysis I'll make the motion then to send it back to public safety, but also to send it to public works at the same time. Second. Make a motion and a second. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion's Aye. approved. Uh, discussion possible action on change of traffic control at 11th Street, St. Croix Street, Bear Drive intersection. This one did come out of public safety with a uh, unanimous vote on installing an all-way stop. And Dean, if you want to kind of yep. do the executive summary on that. Yeah, thank you, Randy. Um, so uh, first of all, I, I'd like to say I'm sorry about whatever happened with the consent agenda versus the business stuff. I, I must have been a miscommunication between me and Chief Owen, so I apologize for that. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I just wanted to say this intersection, I'm sure everybody's aware of it, it's a five-way intersection, uh, kind of as you're, you're either entering or leaving town, depending on which way you're going, uh, kind of downhill from the high school, so uh, St. Croix Street and 11th uh, meet, and then Bear Drive also goes off at an angle. Bear Drive goes uh, under the railroad tracks shortly after that, so uh, there's not only the funky geometry layout of the intersection, but there's also uh, retaining walls, sight distance issues, um, all, uh, there's, a, there's a lot going on there. Um, and, and right now the, the traffic on both the north and south leg of 11th and also the east leg of St. Croix Street are stop controlled and the west leg of St. Croix and the diagonal leg of Bear Drive are not controlled. So that's kind of the through moment right now. Uh, so. Uh, looking at uh, the intersection, um, I came up with some alternatives that I presented to public safety, uh, including all-way stop as, as uh, we're 
uh, talking about tonight. I also uh, came up with some alternatives to maybe close off some of the movements at that intersection to reduce the conflict points and uh, the consensus of the public safety committee is that's not something they wanted to uh, move forward with at this point in time. So because of the site distance issues and the confusing nature of the intersection, I would uh, recommend always stop at that intersection. I'll move to approve. Second. Motion second to approve. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Can I remember Aye. the public speak? Oops, too late. I'm sorry. I was, can a member of the public speak who uses that intersection or not? You already Normally, yes, but we've already taken a vote. Yeah, I know. I couldn't get in before you, like, voted, but. Oh, I, I mean, just as a member of the public who uses that fair road, because I live on Strawberry Drive, and that's the road you take to get into Hudson if you're not going to go around and go by Target. Um, um, I would urge you not to approve it, which you've already done, but, um, it's uh, uh, Bear Road take, I mean, 7th oh, St. Croix Street turns into Bear Road. It's sort of like the main thoroughfare there. And those others are all secondary streets. Um, and, uh, given the, when you're coming up Bear Road to go into town, you go under the railroad bridge. You're on a pretty a, a hill where you'd have to be stopping, and I just think it's going to be a problem in the winter. You're probably going to have more collisions and traffic issues than without the stopways. The sign you've got it now, but that was my two cents. Thanks. All right. So, all those opposed? Motion's approved. I'm, I'm actually opposed to that one. Are you? Okay. Motion's approved. Approve the final development plans for Mayor Road Apartments on Lot 31 of South Point Platt, Platt Len Defco of Hudson, LLC. Uh, thank you. Uh, what you have in front of you, Council and Mayor, is uh, kind of the culmination of a lot of oh, work over the past few months, about over the past year or so. So you'll see a project history that's led us to this 85 unit um, apartment project proposal on the uh, Mayor Road or the Lee property. It's on the far eastern 5.33 acres. Um, again, it's three stories, 85 units. Um, they've changed their initial concept uh, to um, conform, come into conformance with all the staff comments and zoning requirements. Um, and again, you'll see that project history in there that we kind of talk about where we go, we, we, we outline uh, their initial project was 144 units, um, which was um, after a lot of discussion was scaled back to the 85 units, um, mostly to come into compliance with the medium density residential requirement, density requirement in the comprehensive plan, that's 16 dwelling units per acre, uh, which they now meet with the 85 units. So with that, the plan commission recommends approval with conditions. We have a motion. Move to approve. With the conditions stated in the issue sheet? Correct. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is there a second? Second. Motion and second to approve discussion. I, uh, I, the, the maps that I have don't show how the exit onto Mayor Road lines up with either uh, O'Keefe or Industrial or so I'm not, I can't quite place how safe I think that is. I, I have some questions about that particular entrance and exit. Sure, but, that's a good question, uh, Jim. That would align with Stone Creek because obviously we don't want to have a, you know intersections that don't align with each other. We initially thought O'Keefe, but with, you know, after talking to the city engineer um, and kind of reviewing that concept, it's kind of a blind turning space there. So you wouldn't see traffic approaching. So uh, we request that the applicant, you know, move it back further to the west to line up with, with the Stone Creek. <laughs> I'm not familiar with Stone Creek. So it'd be the- <laughs> That road, road goes down that, the development there? Down the townhouses? Correct. 
Oh, yeah, okay. if I may, uh, uh, I wanted to, you know, it's, it's tough to have uh, access on the blind side of a curve to so the inside of a curve. So that's why we, uh, we asked them to move the, the access into a more straight portion of the road. So that way there aren't as many uh, potential sight distance issues. So yeah. that's where that came from. And like it being further away from the uh, Mayor Road and, and uh, O'Keefe intersection. Okay, that's that was the only concern I had in looking at this. Okay, anybody else? It's congruent with our other projects. Um, hi, I'm my name's George Tarasmo. I may I just say something real quick. I um, I just purchased a home with uh, Creative Homes. I'm one of the res residential sites. Um, and I just want to say that um, I don't think they were very upfront about these apartment complexes. Um, I just purchased probably less than a month ago, and they told me they had no plans um, to go there, which clearly isn't true. Um, I was just driving by, and I happened to run into one of the uh, a, a neighbor that kind of knew about this. Um, so he told me to do some more research, and eventually I found out about it. Um, I would say, while we knew something was going to go there, uh, we would have preferred additional townhomes. We understand that something had to go there. Um, but my biggest concern is um, from my back patio to the the decks that are going to be overhanging, it's less than about 60 feet. 60 feet. Um, and that is, I mean, pretty close. Actually, I'm only a two-story, and they're a th three-story, um, looking right into two of my bedrooms and my living room. Um, and from the pictures, it doesn't really look like, I mean, they're putting some minor trees there, but probably going to be gone for six months of the year. The leaves are going to be off. Um, I would just say my, the biggest concern for me is privacy, um, whether that's building bigger trees or putting bigger trees there, or maybe putting a little bit of a hill, some sort of thing in between the residential units and the apartment complex is my biggest concern. Um, but yeah, that just, I just wanted to speak up and say that because they weren't very upfront about it. And I, I, don't, I was one of the last ones in. So I have a feeling that once other people start to find out about it, they're gonna be pretty upset as well. Um, but that's my two cents. So thank you. And, and Jim, a point of clarification too, it might actually be Brookstone. It's, it's, okay. So it's one of those two, but I think it's Brookstone. Nick, can you address that concern? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. My name is Nick Vivian. I'm the attorney representing uh, the project and the, and the developer. Uh, from the very start of this uh, process, that particular five acre parcel was slated for higher density uh, living. It's kind of transitional from the single family residence to 25 uh, to the townhomes to this particular piece of property, uh, which was, uh, as Mike had indicated, proposed to be higher density apartments at, at one point uh, to condos, um, and now we're, we're back uh, after a discussion with the city uh, to the density that's appropriate for that, that site, uh, which is 85 units. Um, so I don't think there's, there's been any um, effort to try to uh, let folks know that or to dissuade folks from from there being a project uh, there uh, I would say that that uh, Landevco is not the develop is not the builder uh, as the the resident uh, noted creative homes is building the single family and the townhomes um, and so we'll make sure that we work with uh, uh, creative to make sure that they're providing folks uh, with the information necessary regarding this project. Uh, I would say that we intend to start moving dirt relatively soon on the apartment uh, complex project um, and so there will be a visible start to improvement relatively soon within the next couple of weeks um, as this is is going to be a, a fall winter uh, project that we're trying to, to move forward this year. Um, additionally, we have worked with the city on a landscaping plan. We'll continue to work with the city um, as uh, Mike and, and Dean and, and others have been uh, good about responding to uh, resident concerns on other projects. We'll certainly take the same approach if there are specific concerns that they'd like to have addressed. We're happy to have those conversations and, and to make sure that, that we do what we can within uh, reasonable bounds. Uh, to alleviate any issues that are that are present out there. Understanding that this is a three-story building uh, and that the land is is relatively flat um, and so there's there are limits to what we can do of course but we will continue to work cooperatively with the city as we have throughout that entire development. 
Anybody else? So Mike Johnson, it looks like we've got a uh, another uh, boundary uh, issue in terms of uh, visibility and privacy. Is, do you think there's anything that can be done there? That's they're pretty close. Yeah, we did look at some work with uh, the, the underground parking access on the north side there, um, kind of making sure that whatever landscaping plan that we, we had there would you know, hopefully address as much of that concern as possible. Um, and I think uh, to Attorney Vivian's point, you know, I think, you know, it, and I have no reason to doubt the, the new resident, you know, if, if there are issues that we need to work through with, with uh, the new neighbors that, you know, I think myself, you know, Mike Mraz, um, and whoever, you know, we'll be happy to, to at least do what we can to, to, to help alleviate some of those concerns. Great. As I just, and I probably should never have looked at the drawing, but I recall early discussions when we were looking at this at Lee property long ago uh, about the, a pathway extending from the, the uh, circle there to straight directly to the pathway on Carmichael. Is that, is that out of the question? I don't think it's out of the question, no. There's some topography issues we're gonna have to work through, but I don't think it's out of the question by any means. Yeah. I mean, we'll certainly have that, the, the, the trail constructed, or it might already have been gone in. Mike, has that gone in, the trail along Mayor and then Carmichael? It has. Yes. Okay, beautiful. So, yeah, we can work through that too. Great. Anybody else? We have a motion. I don't. Oh, okay, we got a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Oh. You voted no? Yeah. Okay. Uh, motion is approved. Presentation regarding. Uh, concept development proposal by Gerard Corporation for properties located at 400 Second Street, 404 Second Street, 406 Second Street, 222 Walnut Street, and 221 Commercial Street. We're going to take a moment to get set up here. So a little introduction, Gerard Corporation obviously owns the properties where the old scuba shop was located, if we're all familiar, in the two neighboring buildings. Um, they have interest um, in, in, a, in, a, in a project that would include their properties. They've owned them for, well, before I started, so approximately four to five years. Um, and they've kind of been working through, you know, what their project might look like down there and gone through a number of different concepts um, looks like they've they've settled on this one um, and this one also includes um, or would include um, some in, some improvements to uh, the uh, Williams parking lot and the the fire the, uh, the old fire station so that's just a little introduction thank you Mike Peter and Paul Gerard, 100 North 6th Street, La Crosse, Wisconsin. <clears throat> we thought we'd take a little bit of time to, we thought we'd take a little bit of time to reintroduce ourselves to the city of Hudson. We started with the city of Hudson back in 1992, um, and <clears throat> there are some new faces. So we thought we'd take a little time to just show you what we, we've been able to accomplish in and around your community and surrounding communities and then <clears throat> at the end um, we'll we'll show you what we have for a conceptual concept of what our vision looks like on the corner of second and and, and uh, commercial so our company's been in business for 65 years we are the second generation it was founded by our father in 1954 um, uh, back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, we did a lot of commercial brokerage and we did a lot of uh, subdivisions throughout western Wisconsin. Um, <clears throat> Peter and Paul are the principals of Girard Corporation. 
I'm joined tonight by our project uh, uh, architect and construction hey, Paul, manager. Can I interrupt you real quick? Yeah, go ahead, Mike. Those that are on Zoom, make sure you go to speaker view so that you can see full screen the presentation if you have it. So, no, it's fine, Paul. It's just. Oh, okay. All right. Sure. All right. Uh, yeah. So, just a lot of these slides are really up, up, up close and personal just to let the city know that. You know, we've been here for 28 years doing business in your community, and we thought we'd just kind of reintroduce ourselves. Uh, the next slide represents uh, what Peter and I have been able to accomplish um, in our, our command of Girard Corporation. We've expanded in, uh, into seven states, and we're quite proud of it. There are a lot of dots that should be in Wisconsin, but we just ran out of room. And that's an old slide, we need to update it. There's a lot more red dots. Here's a slide in downtown La Crosse, historic. That's where our corporate offices is. Those are anywhere from four to $600,000 condominiums. There was seven of them, or excuse me, 17 of them built. And there's about 2,000 feet of commercial where our office is. Um, so, for the record, Peter Gerard, uh, my uh, street address in La Crosse is 100 North 6th Street. Uh, this is a project uh, that was built about eight years ago known as Metropolitan Marketplace. I think maybe some of you are familiar with it. Uh, we've enjoyed great notoriety and success with this project. Um, developed, uh, was a really a, a partnership with the People's Food Co-op uh, organic grocery store and the city of Rochester in major uh, TIF financing that helped make this project go, uh, a major street uh, and sewer, uh, water and sewer project in front of this project that was all done at the same time. We had a major power line to deal with that was all cost shared with the city of, city of Rochester. So it consists of a 26,000 square foot organic grocery store 62 apartments that that filled up right away the tall building in the background there is is the excuse me we've lost that uh picture we don't see the presentation i don't see the presentation anymore yeah. it's, uh, can it help us out with that <laughs> there we go got it all is right it up? so it, it, as a reference if you're not familiar with the property the tall building in the background is is the mayo clinic campus so we're just about three blocks from, from Mayo, Mayo Clinic in downtown Rochester. The next slide represents uh, what we're currently building in downtown River Falls. We are contiguous to City Hall. Uh, we have a 50 unit elderly component and then a 24 unit market rate project. Uh, we are taking occupancy of the elderly building in about uh, two weeks. Here's another project that we worked with the city of River Falls on that just broke ground. It's a 50 unit. And that takes us. I'll just know. Can you go back? Yeah. You want to just know the yeah. North Hudson? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, um, there's also North Hudson that we uh, are in there. And we are getting ready to break ground out in New Richmond as well. And I should also point out that. Uh, in uh, the project on the below 1300, it's where the old motel was. If you can see in the slides, we have about $500,000 worth of solar panels. And then we also have some solar tree flowers there. And we're going to capture about 40% of our electric utility on that building with those improvements of solar products. Yeah, so the solar flowers are going to be quite a showpiece. We're, we're quite proud of, of what we could overcome there. So the next slide, I think what I'll do is I'm going to let Brad jump in and just give you an intro to the property that we currently own on 2nd Street, 2nd and Commercial, and what we our, our vision would be to place there um, based upon if you like uh, us to move forward on that tonight. Thank you, Paul, Mr. Mayor and City Council. My name is Brad Cortbein, the architect for the project. 
I uh, live at 6154 Sweden Boulevard in Punta Gorda, Florida. The, uh, there's a lot of information on this slide and what most important to call out here is that we're located on the right at the corner of second and commercial and that's the building and then behind it is what becomes an important part of making this all work and that would be the parking lot what we're accomplishing there is to take 64 units that are currently there and our goal was to double that and also meet the needs of the building itself we've got parking inside the building with a parking ramp and then we are short of the double the two stalls per unit by 33 stalls so between adding the 64 64 and the 33 stalls we're still exceeding that goal uh, because we're able to provide 166 parking spots uh, for the city on that on that uh, on the Williams lot where the fire station currently was uh, that that's one of the things that is being proposed there and the next slide this is a rendering of the building that's being proposed and also the little insert is a picture of what's currently there so it gives you a real good vision of what we're doing to improve that corner, which is really a primary entrance corner, a cornerstone into the downtown area. And we're using the colors uh, to complement what's currently in the downtown, uh, trying to pick up some of those that are in the other buildings. And then on the uh, first floor there under the awning is the commercial space. And then we've got the parking garage is, is two levels above that. And then we've got the apartments, three levels of apartments above the parking garage. Can we move to the next slide? Yeah, that's it. That's it. Oh, was there, do we have a benefits? No. Yeah, so let me, let me speak to this. My name is Nick Vivian. Uh, I'm the attorney representing this project and the Girard companies. Um, on this particular concept. This is a long time coming, right? And, and so the Girard team has owned this property for a number of years. Um, and there have been a, a number of probably more pressing issues that, that have kept this development from moving forward from the, from the city's perspective. Um, and, and now we feel that the time is right to, to move this forward, which is why we wanted to give you a concept uh, it's it's a rendering, obviously. It's not a final draft, uh, but you can see in that prior slide uh, the difference that you're going to see in, in downtown Hudson as a replacement for the scuba shop uh, to a cornerstone development uh, as folks enter the, the core uh, of the, the downtown, the heart of, of downtown Hudson. When you think about planning this on a more of a global level, this really is a corner of second and commercial, but it wraps up into the Williams lot and to the fire station. And you know, all of this land is important to the overall development of, of this particular site. Uh, you have the RFP for the fire station coming up next. Our, our concept here is really a partnership with the, with the city where that building gets knocked down and, and we build you a brand new parking lot as part of this project, um, in part funded with TIF proceeds, but in part funded because of the development of, of the Girard site. Uh, we knew that uh, as we were approaching this, it was the city's perspective that, and really the goal that you wanted to double your parking capacity on that level uh, in, the, in the Williams lot. And so Brad and Paul and Peter uh, together focused on that goal to make sure that not only are we able to park our development appropriately, but also that we're able to help the city meet, meet its goals. So as part of this plan, you see your parking capacity in that area uh, double at really no expense to the, to the city. Uh, you also see as a significant component, 38 full-time downtown residential units. And, and why is that important? It's important because it provides the city with, with tax base downtown, but it's important because it's 38 
uh, residential units that support the restaurants, that support the shops, uh, that support the professional services, and it provides more walking traffic downtown. Uh, and we understand that it's been a stated goal of the cities, uh, both in terms of, of where uh, elected officials want to be and in terms of long range planning, your downtown studies um, and whatnot, that we bring more people who rely on, on downtown on a regular basis. Um, and so the combination of retail on the first floor uh, with the incredibly competitive rates that will allow for, for retailers to occupy that uh, with 38 units uh, up above. And, and we hear on a regular basis that the look and feel of downtown Hudson is, is very, very important. We don't want to build tall buildings. We don't want to change that, that feel. You know, one of the things that Brad's really focused on is scaling this building, stepping this building back as you go up the hill so that you're not looking at a building that simply goes from zero to, to X feet um, at, uh, on Second Street, but that you see a building that, that steps back and scales back so that it maintains that, that look and feel uh, of, of downtown Hudson. Um, and, and again, you know, this, is, this, is going to, this building is going to stand the test of time downtown, right? And, and so, as we've been focused on what should replace the scuba shop, what should replace that entire property, you know, this is a building that the Girards want to be proud of for the next 150 years uh, because it's going to stand that, that test of time just like all the other historic buildings downtown. So they've taken a lot of care uh, when they've looked at colors, when they've looked at materials, when they've looked at the way these buildings uh, are, are structured, uh, to ensure that there's a respect for the history of downtown and not just respect for today, uh, but for the historical future as, as we move forward because this is going to be a, a building that's probably going to dictate and, and direct what happens with, with other development, other new development in the downtown corridor. So uh, we're, we're awfully proud of, of what we're able to, to present a number of months ago. We told you that we would be presenting a, a concept we wanted to bring this forward now for a couple of reasons. First of all, you have the RFP that you need to address. Um, second of all, um, you've got a second street project in, in terms of the road that's, that's going to be reconstructed and all the work that's going to be done next year. Our, our project uh, fits nicely with that. You know, third, the Girards have, have held this property for a, a significant period of time and they, and they want to get uh, moving forward. Um, on that piece of it. But there's a lot that has to be done in, in terms of the approvals. There's a TIF component, obviously, that we'll want to discuss with the, with the city. Uh, there are some other logistical matters that we'll need to discuss with, with the city. Um, and so there's, a, there's an extended process that we'll have to go through. And this is not a, um, it's not a light undertaking. It's certainly a major undertaking that, that we'll have to go through in, in working with your staff. So uh, we're, we're here tonight seeking comment uh, from the council. Uh, we'd like to start to move this process forward in a, in a meaningful way. We'd, start to like to, we'd like to start to make uh, applications and start talking with uh, the council about TIF and you know, how a number of these things play out so that we can move the project forward. Uh, but step one is in getting your honest and candid feedback about what you, what you like and, and how you see this uh, moving forward. Um, and if there are things that, that uh, concern you in any way, we'd like to know that as well uh, because we want to we put together a project that, that we can be proud of as a development team um, and we value your, your insight as a partner in that project, in that process. So Nick, Paul, Peter, so you've referenced the RFP on the agenda um, for the uh, lot across the street, the fire station, Williams lot, and you're suggesting then that we turn that into parking. We are, and, and let me be clear, your, your RFP was really for soliciting proposals for private development presuming that there was going to be the sale of the, of the land and the development to a private party. Our proposal is that you retain the land and that the, that the city retain, that the fire station come down 
and that the city retains the ownership over the, over the lot and the 166 parking uh, spaces, 164 in the lot and two on the street. So you retain that. And in the future, if you decide that you want to, to put that property out for, for RFP for development purposes, the, the city can do that at any point. But our, our suggestion is remove the RFP from, from the table, allow that, that parcel to be redeveloped with a new parking lot, with 166 spaces, and then make a decision as to whether you need to move forward for RFP purposes at a later date, after you see whether 166 spaces is sufficient to address your concerns regarding parking congestion uh, in that particular area. So, um, and you're, who's paying for the parking lot? Parking lot will be paid for by uh, the Girard development team. As, as part of this process, we'll be talking about TIF and talking about appreciation and, and uh, uh, tax increment that ultimately will reimburse the, the Girards for that parking lot. But they will, they will fund it up front, they will take the risk that the building will appreciate and that they will get paid back on a, on a pay-as-you-go uh, sort of structure. Okay. You would demo the build, old building too? The old building would be demoed, yes. By you, cost? We don't, yeah, we don't ours. know that as of, as of yet. There are, there are a couple of pieces. There's the demolition of the building and then there's an, envir an environmental component that we'd want to discuss with the, with the city. Um, you know, we, we have demolition of the building probably benchmarked at, yeah, 50000 to to $100,000, somewhere in that range. And then there's the environmental environmental component, but in the grand scheme of this project, it's very very minor. Um, and you know, we look at it from the perspective that the city could take that building down at its cost, or as part of the the TIF negotiation process, we can we can build some of that in, depending on what the city is is willing to allow for for TIF. And so you know, we know that there's a baseline for projects in, in this community with respect to TIF, particularly in that downtown district. Uh, if we're going to take on more, obviously we'd like more for a little bit longer, uh, but that's all part of the conversation. But I think our, our goal is to make sure that the city is not, not necessarily out of pocket, that, that it's fully recovering or that, that we're taking the risk and then being repaid through TIF as that mechanism uh, for taking care of those costs. Thanks. All right, questions? Yeah, I guess I, just to clarify, so I'm a little confused in terms of the RFP piece. So Nick would, would um, I guess what I'm trying to ask is if we went ahead with an RFP, would this be a proposal? I mean, could this be submitted as a part of a proposal for the RFP for that area? Well, it, it it could be, and, and um, Paul, that's a good question. From, from our perspective, we would like to see that the city council either commit to this process or move in, in some other stated direction, right? I mean, this is, we're not, we're not asking to buy the property from, from the city. We're not asking to develop uh, something privately um, in this project. We're asking to partner with the city to, to both move our development forward and to help provide a solution to the city's stated parking challenges. And, and we know, you know, for example, that the city has an ordinance that requires uh, two parking stalls per each apartment unit uh, that is included in an apartment complex. We provide for interior parking in this building uh, of enough spaces to take care of each unit, uh, but we need exterior parking. And so uh, it's one of the reasons that we have to get to the point of thinking about this as a, as a partnership because we need to generate additional parking for this particular building, which tells us that we need to develop parking in your parking lot, but at the same time, we need to address your state of the city's stated goal of doubling its, its parking capacity. And so if, if you think about the global planning, whether you think about the Girard project or whether you think about the standalone development of the fire station, I can't conceive of a development 
with the fire station that would both develop the fire station and provide you with twice as much parking as you have today, plus take care of any parking needs related to the fire station. And so we come to this from the perspective of trying to offer a solution both in terms of what will it take to park this building and then what will it take to help the city get to its, its goal uh, of doubling its parking on the Williams lot level, which is why it's, it's our request to you that you pull the RFP, allow this to move forward, you meet your stated goal. It doesn't cost the city any dollars out of pocket other than TIF reimbursement and any of the other incidentals related to the fire station. Um, and you retain ownership such that if you decide at a later date that you want to build a ramp, for example, on the Williams lot, you can put that ramp project out for an RFP. Or if you think somebody's going to come in and build apartments on the Williams lot with a ramp component, you can put that RFP, you can put that out to RFP. So we're not asking you to say no to an RFP in perpetuity. We're asking you to partner with the Girard development team to solve your challenges today and then it will allow you to study your, your parking needs. That's one of the other things that that's kind of delayed this project is we haven't known and the city hasn't known what the new parking system will do for it in terms of moving vehicles in and out of spaces. Well, you're, you still don't know this year because of COVID-19 um, and if you wait to study the impacts next year you're going to be sitting in the same place at the same time and maybe you know the answer and, and maybe you don't. So we suggest with Gerard here at the ready to do a project that this will give you additional capacity without having the results of, of your new parking system and if you decide at a later date that you need another deck of parking you can still move forward with an RFP for private parking or private development of the Williams and, and fire station lots. Anybody else? I'd like to move we rescind the uh, RFP, or is that number no, L? Well, that's, yeah, uh, that's, that's the next one. Any other questions? What's the, uh, the, the height of the uh, building? It so, sort of steps back, it's a little hard to guess, height and number of stories, but what does that look like compared to the rest of downtown? Yeah, it, it, do, it does step back, and, and so currently uh, your code allows for a building in this district to be an average of 45 feet uh, averages as, as measured from the midpoint or as averaged from the from the high and the and the low uh, this building as designed is 53 feet and and when I when I say that there are some things that that we need to work through um, one of those will be a variance for height and the reason, there are a couple of reasons that we think a variance is, is appropriate. First of all, the building is stepped back, um, and so it doesn't have a 53 foot uh, look or feel from, from Second Street. But more important than that is that given the subsoil conditions, we can't go underground with our parking here. And so in a, in a lot of places, when we're talking about parking and meeting your two to one requirement, you have a level of parking that is beneath the, the first floor. Uh, we, we can't do that. We have our, our parking up coming off of the alley, off of that level, and one entire floor uh, is dedicated to parking uh, one vehicle per, per unit. Um, and so we're asking to be able to go up approximately eight feet uh, to accommodate for that one floor uh, that is dedicated to parking to, to meet half of your, your parking requirement uh, as dictated by your code. This is the second street facade height. Correct. No, I said, what, what is the second street facade height? So you, I know you're stepping it back um, to get height. ultimately up to the total height, but what's your, uh, what's the actual street view height, I guess the, you'd say. Yeah, the height coming off of second street is 32 feet. Okay. That's good. All right, anybody else? I have a question. I have a couple questions. Oh, go ahead, Bill. No, 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 go ahead, please, Sarah. Okay. Um, so it was that this is, I know, the second time at least I've seen this uh, a plan for this parcel or these parcels. Um, was it 
38 residential units the last time we looked at this. Did that number change? Yes, that's correct. That's correct, 38. Oh, okay, and then um, I know um, Mr. Vivian, you and I had a conversation once about the occupancy on the first floor on the street level. Um, one of my concerns was that um, I think it was pretty well devoted at that time was you were thinking it would be office space. But I think I heard you say today that um, leaning more towards retail and is, is that, did I hear that correctly? That's correct, ma'am. It's 3,500 feet on the first floor and it's, we're dedicating that to retail at very, very affordable rates. Yeah, and, and let me let me respond to that, you, Sarah, and, and that is that, that we've had conversations with, with Paul and, and Peter um, understanding the concerns about it being too heavily uh, weighted toward professional space that uh, these folks in their in their pro formas have built the lease rates to support uh, boutique retail downtown. So that that will be the intent is to allow shops uh, to occupy this this space and to really bring down uh, shoppers and, and allow shopkeepers to, to thrive based on the rent set that we're going to be proposing here. I really appreciate that that change from last go around. So thank you. Um, for the residential units, do you have a handle on how many are you know one bedroom? How many are two? Is that detail available already or just one minute okay she she's asking you're asking how many ones and two bedroom units correct that was that was kind of yeah i was curious so those one and two bedrooms are split between we have some zeros which are efficiencies um, we also have some one bedrooms and then we have two bedrooms so about 50 percent two bedrooms for and one bedrooms thank you okay bill Yeah, just a quick question on the parking. Um, Nick, you had mentioned that there is a need for surface lots. So what is that number of spaces that you need for the surface lots? And then would you need that in the future? It's okay. Yeah. So our, our need will be approximately 33 uh, spaces, Bill. So as as we look at our our total number it's 166 um, in in total that that we're creating uh, 33 uh, would be in in some way uh, dedicated to the the building uh, whether that be through a, a long-term lease or license or easement or or whatnot uh, the the remaining uh, 133 uh, would be fully owned and operated by the by the city which would effectively double your capacity that you have there today. Sure, so in the future, should we as a city decide to go with an RFP like you were talking about, you would still need those 33 spots in the future. Yeah, that, that's exactly right, to, to meet your, your ordinance. Now, you know, you'll, you'll recall that we worked right. awfully hard uh, over the course of the last couple of years to bring your apartment parking ordinance down from a three to one a requirement to a two to one requirement which we feel awfully good about but is is still that's still a pretty high number um, in that you're going to have you know a number of of efficiencies and and one bedrooms that that may or may not require two so you know from from our perspective it's it's simply a, a plan to meet your ordinance uh, but you know there are other mechanisms to address that particular issue as well we really don't want to seek a just an all-out variance for for parking for numbers. We don't think that solves the issue. You know, we want to make sure that that we have enough parking in that lot uh, to both park our building and help you achieve the the goals that you've set for significantly increasing uh, parking spaces. And, and if I may, it'll be less than 33 because there are some credits in the downtown B3 district for multi-use buildings. So 
33 would be the max. It wouldn't be officially two for, you know, two per one. So. Cool. Thank you. Anybody else? If, if I understood correctly, you were saying that in the future, this would be designed so another level of uh, parking ramp could be added? Yeah, exactly. So what, what we will do is we will we'll design out um, and build the parking lot on the fire station and the Williams lot. Uh, now you'll put in your, your pay systems and, and you'll operate that. Uh, but to the extent that in the future you desire uh, either to have a municipal ramp on that site or to uh, issue an RFP for the development of a private ramp, uh, the uh, lot will remain unaffected and you'll certainly be able to do that if that's an option that you choose in the future. I guess, Nick, um, what I hear you asking for tonight is to see if there's interest from the city. Is that kind of what you're what you're looking for in terms of feedback? Yeah, that, that's exactly right, Paul. So when, when we rolled this out earlier in the year, um, you know, part of, the, part of the issue was that we were still in this process of trying to understand parking and where that would head and then what, what the city would do with the fire station. You know, we think we're at a point now with, with COVID where you're not gonna know what your parking numbers are. And we also know that, that you have a desire, the city has a desire to do something with the, with the fire station. So, you know, and we have a desire to, to get moving with, with our project. So, you know, a, a couple of things. Does anybody have substantive comments on the building as, as designed and proposed, understanding that it's still a, still a rendering and a work in process and there are lots of approvals that, that need to be gained? And then secondarily, um, is the city interested in our partnership proposal regarding parking and the, you know, ultimately the, the partnership to redo your parking lot, uh, the Williams lot, and to take down the fire station to dedicate that all uh, to parking and to increase the, the city's parking spaces that it has on that particular level? So I guess my gut reaction, Nick, is just that this this wasn't really in our packets and so uh, a lot of this is new to me tonight so I have a hard time saying this is the thing to do with that space but I, I would like to see it pursued in terms of conversation between city staff and um, I think we just need more information before we would be able to know if this is workable but I would definitely be open to um, some more dialogue with city staff and giving us a little bit more specifics um but i think right now just having this kind of uh, on the agenda tonight without the specifics beforehand it's hard to to make a determination yeah and 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 that's very fair and one one of the one of the reasons that we we didn't want to give you a whole bunch of information that's to start nice. was because we want to make sure that we're able to have this very high level conversation <coughs> about whether this is a direction that the city would would like to pursue uh, obviously, Peter and, and Paul and their team have put a lot of time and, and money into this so far, and they'd like to continue to, to move forward. And if the, if the response that we get tonight was, we're not interested in, in moving forward, well, that would, that would send a message. But if, if your response is, we're interested in moving forward and learning more and having more discussions about the specifics of this type of plan, that, that's certainly feedback that we'd, we'd be happy to receive and that would give us the, the confidence to move forward in working with Aaron and, and Mike um, and, and team as we start to think about what the, what the process is and what the sequencing is uh, for some of these approvals. Anybody else? My two cents would be that uh, we should be looking at this in more detail. I think it's, there's a lot of attractive pieces to this very attractive pieces to this and we need to and, and we know there's some things that are not answered yet so there's, there's some downside that we need to uh, figure out but that's you guys and the staff working together all right anybody else all right well thank you guys and thank you. hang on for a little bit to see what happens here yeah um all right
Discussion of possible action on a request for proposals for the possible redevelopment of 222 Walnut Street to the existing fire station across the street and 221 Commercial Street, Williams Public Parking Lot. Yep, so we had, we honestly had this on the, we were talking about putting this on the agenda for a little while because um, as I note in the memo, we talked about this in January um, and we were going to issue the RFP probably sometime in March is what our plan was, uh, maybe April. And then we were gonna have a due in, end in July. Um, and it, our discussion at that January 20th council meeting about the RFP was really at that point delaying it until July 31st um, because we wanted to get more data from the parking system, especially including the 4th of July holiday. Um, and then we also wanted to wait until we had more input um, for, for the comprehensive plan um, on the downtown area. We were planning on having in the spring um, a, a basically a downtown listening session for the comp plan um, and trying to get more input on it. Well, obviously with everything that's happened in the world, um, neither of those things have happened we we have not had any sort of uh downtown uh, input uh, session for the comp plan and we really have no idea we have no good parking data um one for the summer and you know two we really don't know for sure what the new normal is going to be for downtown parking moving forward and things like that so um because neither of those things have happened we want to talk to the council about what we want to do with it but obviously this is accelerated by the fact that based on uh, the Gerard's proposal right before this, you know, they have interest in, in, in that lot, not only for using it for some of their parking needs, um, but also in partnering with the city to get the fire hall down and uh, basically turning that into surface parking. Um, and if you remember our conversations about this before, that was one of the comments that we've had is, if we decide not to do an RFP, if nothing else, the city was going to be looking at getting the cost to demolish the fire hall and turn that into um, basically all this surface parking. Um, because if we're not going to, if we weren't gonna look at um, proposals for the for the parcels, we should at least make them usable for parking, which we know is a need. Um, so with the drawers proposal now on the table, um, it was a good time to bring this back to the council to have the conversation. Do you think this is the time to do an RFP um, or not? And, and that's really kind of where we're at with it. Um, you know, it is tied to the Gerard proposal now, but it's not a direct connection. So if we decide to move forward with the RFP, it does not mean that the Gerards won't be part of that process and proposing what they're already proposing and use and things like that. Um, or if we decide not to move forward with the RFP, as, as they talked about in their presentation, it doesn't tie our hands in the future that we can't do an RFP anytime we want to. Um, it's just saying that we're willing to, we're gonna hold off on the RFP for, for now for a number of reasons, um, which could include the Gerard's project, which is you know in the very early stages, but um, it's an excellent project uh, on the face for what we need downtown. Um, it really is everything we're kind of looking for. Um, and so if we hold off on the RFP for now and we allow the Gerard project to, to move forward, and as we've talked about, we need to work through some, uh, some things with them. We need to figure out this financing part. We need to fire, figure out the TID part. We need to, to you know, work on the, the shared parking and, and those things, but there's nothing in there that's not unworkable for sure. Um, and then if that happens and if the Gerard project moves forward and they, as part of their project, take down the fire hall, put in the, you know, the, the, the parking spaces, those sort of things, the city still retains ownership. We still can do this RFP at any point that the council decides that they really want to do this RFP. So at this point, we're kind of at, we wanted to make sure the council had this conversation about, do you think now is the time to do the RFP? Then that's fine, we can issue the RFP. Or do you think it is a time, you know, right now is not the time, let's put it on hold. And now with the Gerard's proposal, we work through that process with them, um, you know, at this point and, and see how that plays out. I guess my th my thought, Aaron, is just there, there's no um, there's no urgency here, right? I mean, there's no. Honestly, like I said, our big point with if we weren't going to do the RFP, staff was going to put together the cost to demolish the fire hall and put in parking, and bring that back to the council and say, if we're not doing the RFP, we should do we should get rid of this building and put parking, and we know it's a need. I guess my instinct would be to say, why why not table the RFP tonight and have some time to have city staff uh, dialogue with 
uh, Girard folks to see, to shape what, what would that look like. Um, I just think we need some time to f sort of figure this out. Mm -hmm. So I don't feel an urgency to do either, we're never doing the RFP or I'll go ahead and do the RFP. I think we just, some of this is pretty new to us tonight. So I think we need to sort of figure out what does this look like and, and, and get it right and make a good decision. Uh, right, and, th and that's the biggest part I want to stress too, is that we're, if you table the RFP tonight, does that mean that you're never doing the RFP? Right. You're just allowing more time. And at some point, whether it's a month from now or a year from now, you can decide to do an RFP if you want to. Right. No, I, I think the thing is we told you that we would, we would bring it back, you know, later on. I would think it would show a good faith that we're interested in flushing this idea out if we just rescind it. As Aaron alluded to, we can always revisit the RFP because if I recall, it was I who made the motion to do the RFP so we could keep the land. So this proposal does both. It takes care of a, a somewhat of an eyesore on 2nd Street and answers our parking problem without giving up the land. So I would, I'd like to move to rescind the RFP and uh, bring it, let them bring the, the, the project here so we can go through it. And Yeah, because uh, if you do that, we could always bring it back up. Any council member can bring it back up or even staff can bring it back up in the future and say, okay, here's where we're at again. What do you want to do? Right. Um, so yeah, that, that, there's no issue with that motion. I don't have a problem with that. I'll so, suck that. All right, we got a motion, a second discussion. Well, I guess I need some clarification on kind of legally, where is the RFP? What is the current state of the RFP? We never did it. We never issued it. Um, it was supposed to have a, dilute, a due date of the end of July. Um, and so the reason, reasonable time frame for issuing it would have been about two to three months before um, for what we were looking for. Um, and then COVID hit and it just all stopped. We were, we were about to publish it before everything happened. And so we never published it. So nothing has occurred with it. So what I'm trying to figure out just legally, do we need to rescind it or is it already just like, is it in a it's, limited it's, land? Well, right? technically, basically it never just happened. Um, and so I don't think that you have to, well, I, I, think I think they the can rescind it. Part of it would just be saying, Hey, we're pulling this off the table for now. And if we want to bring it back later, we'll bring it back later. Um, because technically we do have a motion or we do have a direction from the council right now to do an RFP. Yeah. Right. Um, which staff never did <laughs> for obvious <laughs> reasons, but we never did it. Yeah. So, so I think that's why it makes sense to rescind yep. at least the process that was put in place back in January. Cause that's, that was direction to the council that can't be accomplished. Is that your point? Mm hmm well, and it was also so good faith that we were interested in the project. We need more information. Paul needs more. I need more. Everybody needs more information on it and move it forward. I've got a question. Has there been any interest in utilizing the fire station for another purpose? We do from time to time get contact from like developers or somebody saying, is it for sale? Is it whatever? But we don't know what the seriousness of it is or, you know, what exactly they're willing to propose or anything like that. And I don't know, Mike, you know, when's the last time you got a contact from someone, but I mean, that was kind of the point of the RFP originally was, is we weren't really sure what the serious interest was out there. So that's why I wanted to get an RFP out there to see if there really was that, that interest that somebody's willing to commit something. And there was, in to, there was I interest. Hate, I hate to make a commitment to tear down the fire station without exploring whether there is a there is an interest and in, in a good proposal for utilizing that building oh uh, i'm not sure if i've heard of anybody interested in reuse of it i oh, okay. maybe mike has um, yeah i think I, I think there's varying varying levels of interest you know from you know smaller type development interest towards you know to larger scale but development. but were that were the interest mike the context ever to actually reuse that the building or was it to always take the building down there's a few, there's a couple, yeah. But having spent some time in there during those last couple of elections, I don't really know if I want <laughs> <laughs> well, kind of my thoughts as well, I, I, hard to imagine what could go in there without extensive remodeling, rebuilding. You know, we have again, a, a By demolishing the RFP tonight too, you're not committing to demolishing the fire hall. 
Right. There's a Correct. whole lot of steps and council decisions that would have to be made to get to that point. That's for sure. And we have a developer that we are aware of that has built in our community and have done a great job, and they're easy to work with, if, if I'm correct. Right, Mike? Maybe you didn't hear that. I'll answer for Mike, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I almost have we got bedtime over here. I got kids yelling. Second. <laughs> <laughs> Did you second? Bill seconded oh. it, didn't he? Check with Becky. Randy was asking if... Oh, uh, Gerard has been good to work with, Mike. Yeah, very good to work with. Yep. And they have, they have a good reputation. I mean, obviously, I came, I, I worked in Rochester. I know that that project that they showed in, in their presentation uh, really kicked off the kind of the downtown redevelopment boom that happened. That was the first big mixed use development that Rochester had downtown. Um, and at, now, if you go down there, there's a ton of them, but they were the first one. Um, and it's an excellent one. I mean, it was kind of the, the, the one that was the basis for the others that came after it. Um, so, uh, yeah, if you're talking about that question of, of how they're to work with, and, and I think reputation, and I think both are excellent. I mean, I think the more I think about it, I think the rescinding does make sense because I think we just need to buy some time to look into the Girard partnership and just see if that would be workable and, and, and that would buy us the time. There's no urgency in my mind to do the RFP if we have this other possibility happening, so. All right, so anybody else? Got a motion second? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion's approved. All right, uh, I don't have anything. Anybody? Move to adjourn. Second. Motion is second to adjourn. All those in favor? Oh, wait. Opposed? Motion is approved. We stand adjourned. Thanks, everybody.